If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell icon to get the latest updates. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, okay, so we will just go to do the quick summary like, like we did yesterday. Can you see my Word document? Um, yes. Yeah. So why is the distribution model required? Is it one way or both ways? So yeah, distribution model is required to distribute the deliveries, right? And also the uh, manufacturing order. And it's one way from ECC to EWM. Um, do we still need a distribution model for embedded s 4 Of course, you know, it has a separate instance. So we got to maintain the distribution model regardless of embedded or um, uh, decentral. So name the main BAPIs, delivery save replica, and uh, delivery changes. These are the BAPIs flowing from ECC to EWM. Uh, which technology or interface is used to communicate between uh, the systems? QRFC, right? And uh, yeah, you can call it BAPI, the QRFCs, and uh, yeah. and uh, the master data going through IDOCs. And um, you know, we are we we didn't touch the topic, anyways. So master data, keep in mind, it's just IDOCs or the DRF. Data replication framework, uh, but transactional data through QRFC. Which are the transactional data that are transferred to EWM? Uh, at the end of the day, we have deliveries, whether you call them inbound, outbound, or posting chain deliveries, or all are deliveries only. Can we delay? Yeah, we can delay it, and then uh, the background job will run and it will look at the you know, incompletion controls or the routines, and then uh, if it's appropriate, then it will uh, distribute it. Um, what is the significance of delivery split uh, to avoid a mixed bag scenario? A mixed bag is possible in a sales order or a purchase order, but not in a delivery. Uh, are changes possible? Uh, yes, changes are possible for IBD and OBD. OBD only if you're a S4 and a customer, but IBD, uh, it's uh, by default available. Um, OBD, it was just introduced in 9.0 or something, four years back, I think. Uh, uh, for e-commerce customer, especially. What is the purpose of business system and group that we know in the complex landscape directory? Each uh, system should know where to communicate back, especially the EWM system should know where it has to communicate the GR and uh, GA messages. So what are the additional handshakes happening from EWM to ECC, anyone? We know the forward uh, communication, the delivery uh, save replica and delivery changes, but what is the return communication? Um, from AWM to ECC. Pick confirmation, pack confirmation. Pick confirmation, pack confirmation. Um, uh, yeah, the okay. PPF, PPF for yeah. GI. Yeah, GR and GA, correct. This is good issue messages. Pick confirmation also, I think we can uh, communicate, yeah. GR, GA, the delivery changes, the batch split and um, <clears throat> And you know the without reference to the the delivery right, which is called the direct outbound deliveries, meaning the deliveries are initiated first in AWM and then replicated back. Uh, you know those deliveries are also communicated yeah. um, as well physical inventory, uh, extra reconciliation. Yeah, the all the material postings, you know, direct postings for the, the, the okay. non-delivery interface, so-called non-delivery interface. Yeah. And also keep in mind, uh, AWM can initiate the PO and STO creation as well. So, okay. Um, many things are happening from AWM to ECC. Where we can see the failed queues, I'm not sure. It, it always it's uh, displayed in the inbound because you know, while taking off, uh, it's not a big deal. Landing is a problematic one, um, especially if the runway is a short runway. So, uh, so here- SM15, uh, right? SM15, hmm? SM15 and we can do that queue clearance. Right? SMQ2. Okay. SMQ2. SM59 maybe for the regular RFC and QRFC is SMQ2 maybe. How the return communication happens from EWM to ECC, thanks to the, you know, the PPF directly calling the uh, system through the business system, uh, which is there in the delivery document. Um, are there any other interface for communication other than QRFC and SIF? Uh, yeah, we have many things, web services, uh, the WCU interface, the Telegram interface and um, uh, IDOCs, yeah. Okay, so that's where we stopped. And a uh, little bit we know about the CCK and the prerequisite in the PO is the CCK. And um, the document controls, you know, you're going to talk, it's quite dry topic, but uh, 
just just uh, follow me after that you know there is a, a much relief i say is these are interesting topics the org elements today we will try to cover the org elements but um, let's quickly complete the document uh, uh, you know nuances um, so here uh, yesterday we did the vanilla demo for inbound and then if you want i can show you outbound or we can keep it later you want me to show the outbound now or Yeah, I mean, that will be logical. Yeah, be logical. Yeah, so the outbound process, we know there are two documents. Ignore about, you know, forget about this document, the ODR or the IDN. Let's not focus much. Uh, there are only two documents. We know the significance of both of them. Anyone, what is the main purpose of this final delivery? Hmm? That will communicate back with uh, our core. That's that's That is the one, but uh, it is required for uh, splitting line items. Splitting the delivery delivery split, late outbound delivery split, not the early split, and also you know the invoice before GA, which issue. Okay. Now let's do a demo. There is still something called scale integration in the CC packing station. Uh, is that same in EWM also? Wait, scale yeah, in the pack workstation, you can connect a scale interface. Um, okay. Same like your HU passed. You know? okay. We have one for Fury and the other one for uh, the regular backend transaction. Even you can connect to the parcel carriers, you know, the XPS mm -hmm. or whatever, the UPS and FedEx. Or, um, POD, yeah. Uh, POD, the end of the day reconciliation and you know pushing the data and getting the pro number or the tracking number. Yeah. And you know, additional fields for the uh, freight services, right? Next day shipment or mm -hmm. those additional details, you know, like yeah. Um, now uh, let's see the stock if it is there. I think we'll have the stock yesterday. We placed it, you know. So I just directly go to uh, I, I don't want to, you know, do sales order, but we'll zero one no, you know. For most of the things I will do without reference delivery, but uh, for some cases I will do sales order. So the delivery type is yellow without reference and uh, sales organization is 1000, uh, 10 and 00, zero I guess. So 17, 10 only, sorry, 17, 10. So we are playing with two customers only, customer one and two. So take the customer one and say the goods issue date is tomorrow. And the material same VT uh, LP107. Let's say I will take 10 quantity. So it's coming to my location. Uh, just check your Varos number, you know, E07 and uh, save the delivery. So the ECC delivery is distributed or the LE delivery is distributed, 556. And now you can, uh, you know, go to monitor, SCWM, uh, MON. Outbound folder. Okay, so I copy the number. SQ, I mean, it's weird. You had to reference uh, documents you want to see. So select this. Okay, the delivery landed. And as usual, right from here, you can just click on the odd spot. And then, um, and then this is the ODO, the main document. And then the final delivery is uh, not yet created. You see the number is not there. It, uh, it will happen the moment you press the PGI. So I'm going to pick the, I'll show the delivery split also. So is it okay? You will not get overwhelmed, right? Or you want to show a, see a vanilla demo? Yeah, I know that's fine. Yes. 
I'm showing some complexities. Try to grasp as, as much as you can, and then you know practice them by watching the video. Or you know you can do the simple thing, not a problem. If you are, um, you know, watching the complex one, little complex one, I wouldn't say like we are not complicating that much. Just just watch the split thing. Even I don't know how to do the quantity split, but the H split I can do. I think. Uh, So I'm creating the task. It's taking from rack storage. Um, you know, the source H is there. Get 10 quantity and um, save it. Okay, I can do two things actually. You know, I can create partial quantity task only. So instead of confirming, I'll cancel the task. So I'll just create for seven. Outbound follow on functions, create task. So I'm just creating it for seven quantity. Assuming, you know, I have only seven uh, available in the warehouse, you know, whatever reason the remaining uh, three is not available. Let's just, um, Assume that as a scenario, so this is an open quantity for three. Now I'm going to confirm the task for the seven outbound delivery follow on function. Sorry, if I want to display the task, uh, you can do it in the monitor, you know. So go back, hopefully, uh, yeah, the task is here. Okay, and uh, you know, as I said, uh, keep, keep refining your uh, layout. So the quantity is here. Okay, bring it, uh, the material number and other things are not there. So product code, and then the stock, alternate unit of measure, the base unit of measure, stock type, these are required. I don't know whether it will come. No, only one. Okay, so no problem, I'll do it later. Uh, save this layout. All right, so now I'm going to confirm the task. You know, I showed you yesterday how to do it in the mobile device. Uh, you can try that as well, but there is one more way of confirming the task here. You can do it in the background. So the task is confirmed now. And um, they just go to the audio. So only uh, partially completed, you know, the picking status. So I press the button uh, OD. Error record for generation of outbound delay quantity must be fully picked. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm instilling, right? If I'm not having a I don't know how to split that one. Maybe uh, there's a way out but I'm not good in the system steps now. Process code, uh, outbound delivery um, creation, this is what expected. So let me pack it, you know, uh, where is it the stocks are there? Uh, it is in the staging area, right? So I'll move to the staging area. Uh, how do we know? You can jump to the task and jump to the task and see the form view. So it's at the staging area. And source HU, we have taken the quantity seven, but we don't have the HU at the destination. So I can pack it here, you know, within the delivery, I can do the packing. As usual, you know, you take the S4 STD pallet, uh, only one packaging metal we have for pallet. Okay, enter a bin, same bin, GA staging area bin. So I pack the seven. Now, at least I have some control, you know, I can go to the HU tab and then I can select the HU and, and I can press the outbound delivery, create outbound delivery for this HU. So this is working, you know, but if it's not HU, then uh, there should be a way out. You know, we just need to explore uh, the functions here within the ODOM. 
so now i have the you see the od is created you know 2001 are you guys following so this is the original yeah. delivery 556 and now if i go to the od the final delivery this has some sort of late outbound delivery split or you know you can uh, uh, call the customer and say i am sending only seven today you know remaining three would be shipped tomorrow so for these reasons you do that and then this is the new delivery number a different number range created initiated from ewm you know this is the child delivery and this is the mother delivery uh, if you look at this 85 whatever so go to vl03n So you see it's posted seven, you know, still the GA is not posted because we just created the outbound delivery only. So uh, I, I don't know whether it has the original reference or not. So it's not having the reference, but if you're dealing with sales order, I should have shown a sales order scenario. Then uh, all the delivery references uh, would be in the sales order. You know, it's very easy to track from the sales order, uh, but, but yeah, I, I took the other option, direct delivery creation. So. Now, if I check the original delivery, the mother delivery, now you see it's, uh, it's three, three quantity. Following, the split happened, the split happened. Yeah. Okay, now I can post the goods issue for today's shipment, which is seven quantity. So done, goods issue done. And then what I'm going to do, assuming this is uh, you know the next day or the evening of the same day, the remaining three quantity, I, I got the stock, you know, I figured out the stock or, uh, you know, now I'm going to do the picking and do it as a next shipment, uh, the three quantity. Why it's taking from two different places. Okay, this is a complete HU and this is a taking. So I, if I want to take it from this HU only, 81752, I can do that, no, 817152. I don't want to take from two HU, either I can do it from one HU. So I just delete the system proposal. They go to default values, they give the source HU. Oh, I can't give the source HU. Mm. Okay, so stock and bin, uh, handling unit. So here I can give that HU number and know the bin. So this is my bin, sorry. All right, so um, while, while creating the task itself, you know, or confirming the task, we can uh, give the PKHU, not a problem. So if I do it in the mobile device, I'll show it in the mobile device. So the confirmation, the WO has fallen in the outbound queue. So the outbound queue, I am qualified to work, you know, so me as a resource uh, operating uh, with the forklift number seven, I'm qualified to work in the outbound queue. So I log in. And then I go to outbound process and pick in, uh, pick system guided also I can do, but I'm not sure there could be something in the pipeline. So I can go by uh, the W number and I can just give the W number, sorry, the W number. All right. Now I can create a, a pick at you on the fly, you know, meaning I can go to the back station and I can scan the uh, existing reusable tote or I can generate a label also every time you know both the options are there S4, STD, pallet or cotton you can take whatever you know there are two or two materials only so let's take a pallet and if it's a reusable pallet it will have a number right for example pal 0107 I'm just giving some number excellent number you know and then uh, you can just enter if it's an internal number you can print it out you know so these options are there these are the ones which we talked about, you know, there are 500 screens and, um, you know, 150 plus uh, navigations uh, transaction or transaction variants are there. So, you know, if you are uh, developing the APIs, uh, you have to be careful. I've seen some people, uh, you know, developing without, uh, yeah, it's better to manipulate or, you know, the, tweak it to the customer requirement rather than building it from scratch. And also I've seen some customers, you know, clients very, panicky about this uh, they assume that this development is a 
a modification to the code or something right so it's not a huge development it's just a warranted actually you know without this uh, you can't imagine the implementation you know? of course we need to uh, this just a framework sap has given so you should be able to adjust to the you know adapt to the client's requirement so now I scan the source issue scan the bin sorry scan the product and three and then i put it in this palette of issue and then i bring it to the ga area goods issue staging area done now i go to the odo right the original odo Yeah, this is the ODO number 3103. Now this item, you know, you see only one uh, split happened, no, for seven. Now if I press the PGI, automatically, you know, the ODO is created. I don't need to do explicit because, you know, whatever leftover, I am shipping it today, the three quantity. Any questions? Are you guys following? Could you have taken the mix issues also for week picking, like pre-existing, but having some already some cons in that, uh, was it possible? Like I'm collecting everything into one mix issue, mix pick, pick issue. Yeah, you can do it. You know, only thing is, uh, uh, it would be in, um, uh, um, yeah, if it's uh, allowing the consolidation group mix, you know, you can take it, uh, not a problem. Yeah. You can keep loading them. Yeah. For example, you picked for uh, delivery one and delivery two, and it is with you only, you know, somewhere. Then uh, the third delivery landed. So you are picking for the third delivery and you can re reuse the same HU, you know? So there is a leftover space there. So that's what yeah. I, your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that helps for the packing, no? one packing. I can combine multiple picks into one pack unit. Mm. Normally you drop it at the pack workstation and it's a headache of the packing uh, operator. But you as a picker, if you want to do that, yeah, it's also okay, you know? Why do you want to keep the partial palette? You know, rather you keep it at the place, and you know somebody is there to consolidate them, or you leave it at the staging area, and then you know um, mm -hmm. uh, you can add, and you know this, this they, people can consolidate them. But the option is there. You know, I've mm -hmm. seen some requirements also. You know? Yeah, there's a MOA group they asked for that kind of requirement. Uh, yeah, it's possible. Now I just press the button PGI. And what will happen? Guess what? Hmm? In ECC? PGM. PGM also might be inverse also probably. No, the mother is technically completed, meaning 556 five, is uh, zeroed out. Oh, it's not happening. Why it's not happening? Q stuck, what? SMQ2. It's becoming more problem by six it's stuck here okay interval this year problem <laughs> all material documents um okay just go to snm what is the object rf underscore billet or if underscore change. Where is the number range? Yeah, 1710 intervals, 49. Hmm. Yeah, 49. 49 we have 2022 only. <sighs> So this is QRFC, you see, the decentral uh, goods issue failed. That's why, you know, the split message failed and the subsequent GA, GA failed, you know. So this is QRFC.
Why? 49 to year 2023. Hmm? Interval 49 to year 2020 does not exist for 1710. Just now we maintain, right? 49. There's no way to search a system. Just position is not there. Yeah, 49, 2023, 49. It's still maintained, right? 49, 2023. Hmm? Saved it. Overlaps with the interval. Oh, the lap interval, 49 overlaps with the interval. Saved or not? It's not saved. I don't see any entry other entry than 23. Not to say, of course, yes, but it, there's a overlap, right? Interval, what in overlaps with the interval? There must be other number range. It is hmm. other point? number range. So hmm. we can introduce a it's all the same number in number and it is a line 49. 50. Yeah, 50 is yeah, 50. I was checking what all is equal to 10, 23. 2022 gone, right? 2023 now. So, what's the problem? It's consuming till 153. 154 and then. So, I just gave, right? Even we can just give some different number, huh? Seven. The, the MM experts uh, teach me something when number range. Huh? 2023. Overlaps. So, shall, shall we take a different? Uh, Where is it overlapping? How to find overlaps? Oh, oh, oh. no, my mouse. We don't see any overlaps, right? Mm. Okay, let's take uh, 41. Forty one also will be there, right? No, forty one not there. Okay. Oh, whatever. I just double click that to check enter forty nine overlaps message or words about this. Just forty nine overlaps with the interval. Uh, 49 overlaps. No idea. Oh, weird message. 41 overlaps. 
I, I don't have any options also to select and secure lab edit insert here 2023 49. Okay, let's keep moving, man. We want to see. I, we'll fix it, you know, later. Don't worry. Now, what's what's happening, right? The um, original delivery, the mother delivery, will be closed technically, and then there will be one more delivery created, right, for the three quantity. So you see here, the there's one more got created, 2001 and 2002. Understood? Three, three and seven. Yeah, the reference document number, you see, uh, it's just, uh, the original one is 556. Then uh, we have two more deliveries created, ODs. Uh, let's go to 2001. Yeah, 2001. And the reference document number is uh, 8500170. And the other one is 1701. So two, two children are there. 556 five, resulted in two deliveries now. 556 five, will never be used. You know, the moment you split the delivery, the original delivery will never be used. That's the bottom line. Uh, there's a partial GR concept, but there's no partial GA concept. You know, the original delivery, once it is split, it, it would be um, closed technically when you do the final shipment or you know, the pending shipment. Um, okay, so that's about the split delivery. And um, yeah, if you want to appreciate, then you know you have to see the goods issue. And reversal always happens from the final delivery, uh, as you rightly said. This is the one communicating the PPF actions uh, to the ECC system. And you know the reversal uh, you can't do it in BL09, so you got to do it here only reverse GA. Clear. Rajan, I have one question. Uh, yeah. In PPT, you showed us that uh, after OBD creation, a wave manages there, right? So, but in this process, we have not uh, heard any wave or something. So, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, so I just was checking the flow chart in IBD. It was not there, so that's why I didn't ask. But yeah, here we are showing yeah, in PPT. In PPT, yeah. Uh, uh, not here. Okay. Yes. So wave is wave is optional. So wave is only required for a complex high throughput, high intensity, you know, warehouses. Otherwise, simple warehouses, you can just work with the deliveries. You can schedule the background job PPF, you know, for picking. For example, uh, the PPF job will be running every one hour, you know. So whichever delivery lands within the uh, time, it will be grabbed by the PPF, you know, and then the picking can happen. Wave, uh, as I said, you know. Um, Wave is really recommended, you know, even for a mid medium complex warehouses also. Without wave, it's simple, you know, shooting in the dark. But I have taken a vanilla demo only, you know. So wave, I don't want to complicate first. You see, our system is, you know, having trouble with the number range only. The goods issue is not posted. Yeah. Wave, we will see, you know, wave is yet to come. When it okay. comes, it so will be like a tsunami wave. wave. Yeah, um, I'll show it. A dedicated one, one, okay. one, hour, one hour session for wave. Yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Now I'm... Uh, now I'm just like, trying to explain the basics, you know, the documents, uh, trying to get a grip on the documents, uh, the need for the second document, and what are the activities, you know, uh, by, by watching me, you should, you could take some tips and tricks and, you know, you know how to confirm the task uh, multiple ways uh, in the monitor and then in the RFUA and within the delivery. So these are the things you should, uh, uh, you know, grab now yeah, I got it. And, and then you can do it on your own you know when you're doing the exercise it will simplify your time you know minimize the time so now let's keep going um so i don't want to spend much on this theoretical thing the document uh, controls um we talked about the system integration and also now we have a good understanding of the different documents now we need to do the document mapping you know so the ecc uh, Either you say document type or delivery type, it's one and the same. You know, when it comes to delivery, it is delivery type. For example, the PO or sales document, it is document type. But uh, ideally, document or delivery type is one and the same, basically controlling the header. And then EWM also, we have document type and item type, you know, because in any implementation, uh, we shouldn't touch the standard one. For example, you know, the SD consultants, they know, or the MM consultants, they know, they will not touch the EL or NB. They make Z and B or Y and B or whatever, right? The customer number range, um, Z series or Y series. So uh, in EWM also, we have to make the custom document type. 
for a simple mundane reason of having a number range, different number range, or it could be uh, complex things like you know the status profile or incompletion control profile. So this is the ERP document type, map to EWM document type, and um, there's something called code initiator. You know, uh, it is automatically you know coming through the QRFC uh, based on the business transaction you are doing. You know, for example, if it's a repetitive manufacturing uh, production receiving, it will take INBM. You know, if it's a EGR based thing, then it will take INBA. Something like that. You know, so it's a one to many relationship. Um, same like your reference moment type. Uh, what is the purpose of reference moment type? Uh, the WM moment types are connected to IM moment type via the reference moment type. Huh? So why do we need the reference moment type? One to many. Same reason, right? One to many. One to many or many to one. Normally one to many, you know, because there could be more uh, WM moment types compared to uh, the IM moment types. Similarly, there could be less uh, ERP document types, but we need more EWM document types uh, or other way around. You know? Similarly, we have to map the item categories also. Item categories or item type, one and the same. Okay, so ECC document type, ECC item category or item type, uh, and you know EWM document type. And the differentiating factor is there. This is for uh, STO scenarios and you know uh, customer return scenarios. Uh, if you know the scenarios, then uh, you should be able to appreciate the indicator. Otherwise, it's a bit tricky. You need to know the uh, different uh, you know, logistics process uh, to appreciate this field. Um, then the item type. Just to have a different item type for the catch weight product, uh, there's one more indicator you know, for catch weight products. So bottom line is the item types are mapped. The document types are mapped. And um, you know why do we do this? Because the... In SAP, every document is structured, you know, header and item, and maybe sub items also or scheduled lines also. So the header is controlled by the document type, and item is controlled by the item type. Whether you call it delivery type or item category, it's all one and the same. You know, the delivery type and document type are same, item type and item category are same. So I'm just showing an example of uh, ESD module screenshot. Uh, you see, LF, LF is a standard delivery. So what are the controls at the delivery type level? So these are the controls, you know. Now, why do we copy LF and make it ZLF? The main simple reason is a number range and more pertinent reason would be like, you know, the uh, output procedure, which outputs are relevant and um, partner procedure, uh, text procedure, you know, status profile, uh, which status are relevant and screen sequence, incompletion control, you know, incompletion control text, which text has to be copied uh, from the sales order or the quotation to the delivery. Um, partner procedures, which are the partners like sold to party, ship to party, you know, uh, freight forwarder, carrier. Um, reference document profile, you know, what are the reference documents should be shown? So all these are the controls, you know, basically for which we have the Z document type or Y document type and Y item type. Item type for item level control and document type for other controls. But you might have noticed, you know, the J is common. Here, the item category also has J. That is called document category. So wherever it is saying category, uh, uh, you will not modify them, you know, because the SAP programming logics are written based on the categories. So you don't touch it normally, you know. You have to be, um, yeah, crazy if you are touching that, or if you are really, you know, super smart, then you'll touch the document category. So otherwise, normally we settle at the document type and item type or item category. And uh, you know the common denominator is the document category. Uh, is this clear? This is not a EWM thing. This is a ECC SD. Uh, uh, anything you want to add, Bipin? No, I mean ECC is clear, but for EWM, you said that we have similar things in EWM also to control. No, no. Did I miss something, or you want to add something to finish the ECC properly? You know? No, no. This is okay. This is okay. Okay. So now uh, in EWM. Uh, forget about this top one, you know, we don't care about the notification, the ODR, the request, you know, these are all uh, gone topics because we are connecting to the SAP uh, core or, you know, we are working on S4 and I implementations only. So this, this doesn't matter really. If you are a 3PL, then we have to, you know, bother about these things. Now we are left with only four document categories. Uh, in fact, five, you know, because two we know for outbound, the remaining are all one. So four plus one, five. Uh, document categories, you know, SAP has provided PDA for inbound, PDO for outbound, SPC for posting change, and WMR for stock transfer. 
and FDO for the final delivery, you know, the third delivery, which we just know, sir. And then, as I said, uh, in any implementation, we don't use the standard document type INB or OUTB. So we make ZANB or ZNB or ZOTB, you know, and um, we, we, we tag it with the document category and then derive the uniqueness. Whatever custom requirements, like, uh, you know, we, we call them profiles in AWM, not the procedures. If you see the SD, they call them procedures. You know, these are the procedures you see in completion, partner procedure, text procedure. But here we call them profile. So these are the same profiles, you know. Uh, typically, we create a custom document type to uh, make some fields, you know, mandatory or, you know, to make some fields uh, mandatory using the incompletion check. If the field is not populated, the delivery will be in the block status, uh, you know, or the subsequent um, uh, posting will not happen. So I'm just showing some uh, screenshot of the uh, inbound delivery or, you know, this is the um, reference document category profile where you are saying which documents I want to show. For example, the uh, ECC uh, vendor number, the LE number, the PO number, you know, it could be the production order number, reservation number, or the pro number. So that's all part of the reference document uh, category or profile, reference document profile. Then the date profile we need to map, you know, for example, the ECC delivery planned goods issue date has to be mapped. And also the prediction order, uh, you know, operation wise, uh, uh, end time has to be mapped or start time has to be mapped. End time we don't care, start time we have to map. And also the partner profile, right? Whether it's a cross dock warehouse or, uh, uh, you know, a for forwarder or the, the carrier, the freight forwarder, uh, many parties, right? Ship to party, sold to party, and other warehouse plant, uh, you know, where we are sending in the STO scenarios. So all the partner profiles are part of the procedure or profile. And the status is a big topic in AWM, you know. You can have a custom status also. And um, uh, for example, uh, you're doing some activities, you know, in the absence of QM, quality management in the outbound, uh, you can uh, introduce a custom status, you know, uh, to check and to consolidate and capture the serial number. Uh, without which you know you can't trigger the pga so in that scenario you will have a custom status and also you know some fields you will uh, make it uh, mandatory using the status management and you know make it binding without populating that field you can't trigger the goods issue so you have to know the nuances of configuration of uh, status management the incompletion check and also and also uh, what else uh, yeah, status management and incompletion should be good enough. Field control to make it a mandatory, optional, or uh, display only. And action profile is the most important one. You know, this is the PPF, post processing framework. This is the one uh, used uh, pretty much everywhere in EWM, you know, in sending the GR message, the GA message to do the print outputs, you know, whether a HU label or a, you know, manifest or a packing slip. All actions are triggered by the action profile. So the out of all the profiles, the most super important one is the action profile, you know, and uh, the other things comes uh, later. Text management, same things, you know, which text has to be copied all the way from the delivery as a picking instructions and displayed it in the mobile device, you know. Just one example of the text management. Um, any questions on this? Uh, finally, finally, we assign the profile either to the document type or to the item type based on the control. If it's item level control, you got to assign it to the item type. Say for example, the action profiles are not applicable at the item level, uh, whereas it's applicable at the header level. You know, If the header, header fields are to be controlled, then you assign it to the header uh, document type, uh, the profile. The screenshot is not good. I should show some screenshots with Z or Y, you know, and the document type itself would be Z or Y. This is just to show you, you know, but this is all native, uh, this is all default ones. Huh? So SAP standard ones, uh, you may not be able to appreciate. So imagine, you know, you are having your Z profile, prefix with Z or Y. Any questions, guys? Uh, um,
So, so very general question. I mean, other than just changing it to Z, did you find any need to actually customize a lot or this out of box uh, AWM configurations are good enough uh, for a lot of customers? I know that it more depends upon the customer requirement, but just what's your experience? Most of them are, you know, uh, inactive. You just need to activate them. You know? uh, the sales management, for example, you know, it remains most of uh, the standard ones. Uh, most of the sales are inactive. For example, the shelf life, you know, or the uh, over delivery, under delivery tolerance. By default, it will be inactive. So you just need to activate them, you know. Some minimal things only you have to do, but it, okay. it depends actually in a complex project, we have to, you know, fiddle with the, uh, especially the incompletion status, you need to know uh, with the ABAP developer, you know, how to make them binding and, you know, one uh, interdependent on the other. So those are the okay. interesting ones and quantity also you know you will learn a lot especially when there is a lot of decimal and you know different unit of measures that projects would be a real nightmare uh, that's where you learn the quantity offsetting profile you know all the quantity calculations and, yeah but otherwise the remaining things are straightforward you know the status and uh, incompletion how to bind them how to you know interconnect them and quantity is a big topic altogether you know every project uh, you will face a uh, especially you know with the different SKUs, different unit of measures and the rounding residuals you know that's where the complexities are there otherwise other profiles are straightforward you know the ppf there is a cookbook if you read the cookbook in fact two cookbooks or playbooks are there uh 60 70 page something like that uh, you know if you go through them then you are the master in ppf at least the action profile uh, you as a functional consultant um, you should know it to work with the developer Okay, since SAP has stopped development for WM for more than a decade now, I see that a lot of customizations getting built in the standard WM, including the mobile data entry. Uh, but you think that in AWM, that's not the case, right? I mean, the extent of the customization in ZOP6 will be far, far lesser. Far lesser, you know, are the, there are three broad categories or four maybe, you know, I don't know, but uh, one is the bodies, right? The bodies, there's no escaping. You have to implement a body. The second one is the the dialogue, you no, know, the RFUA dialogue. Whether you use a mobile GUI or uh, the ITS, you got to um, tweak the dialogue, you know, the user dialogue, the user interaction. There's no escaping, you know. So you should know the uh, all the developers, strong developers with you know expertise in the PA, PBO modules, you know, all the nuances, the logical transactions, blah blah blah. And then uh, bodies, they should be able to do it. The third aspect is. Um, uh, how to you know configure the monitor flexibly and the one which we just now talked about you know the the profiles right the profile uh, showing the additional screens fields you know in the monitor and in the delivery uh, the ew they say you know if uh, custom fields needs to be added to the delivery header or delivery item those things are now simplified now but still you know these are the activities typically in a project uh, required you know additional fields in the product master and uh, in the documents uh, and monitor customization uh rf dialogue and bodies okay so you think that other than the pure functional skills it's a little more of a technical debug skill than maybe uh, some on the uh, BRF plus kind of skills will help, right? Or do you think that more of a pure function are only seen in EWM? BRF, uh, why BRF is coming here? I, I saw that BRF plus also is used for some strategy. BRF plus uh, is used only for labor management, you know, the okay. mathematical equation expressions okay. and other thing. If you okay. are not working in a LM project, then no okay. worries about the BRF. Yeah. I used to debug, but I forgot totally now, you know, there's no need for debugging. You get a good developer and, you know, you sit with them for a couple of hours and then done with the job. Yeah, but I've seen, say, many consultants, you know, they learned the logic, business logic through debugging only, you know, that's a different approach altogether. Yeah. Okay, there are some special things like, you know, the ECC uh, based on the header item level. Uh, you can determine the item uh, types also you know similarly there are some special procedures like uh, egr or kit to stock or you know there could be some other scenarios also additional controls are there to determine the item type so the item type is not straightforward uh, not always straightforward let me just rephrase uh, if it's straightforward then you are the mapping here direct mapping here you know the one directly coming from ecc is uh, 
map to the item type in EWM, not a problem. There are some special scenarios where some additional uh, attributes will play a role in determining the item type. In that case, you know, there's one more uh, configuration to determine the item type based on hierarchy and based on the higher level uh, time, based on the predecessor item. So if you see, these are the three additional attributes. Um, All right. So I just shown one simple example. For example, uh, there's something called order reduction. If the sales order quantity is reduced, you know, the EWM will respond to the changed order quantity. Even after picking also, the pack workstation guy can respond to the reduced quantities, you know. So this is called order reduction, not to be confused with the delivery change, you know. So order reduction is a functionality where the sales order can be changed, basically quantity reduced, uh, at any point uh, in the warehouse operation, you know. So in that case, what we are doing, the status profile of the SAP standard, uh, this order reduction is inactive, you know, we need to make it active, simple. It will be checked in the standard. You need to uncheck it. Um, okay, and then the quantity offsetting profile, there are two uh, fields are there, you know, quantity reduction and, you know, cancel. So these two are inactive. You just need to make, make it active. These are the simple things, you know, you as a functional consultant would be doing. I would say 60, uh, uh, 40 to 50 percent of the projects, you know, this is the work we have to do. And uh, you know, remaining 50 percent of the project, there could be more complexities, you know, like we have to play with the aggregated status, transient status, and other thing. But it's a bit tricky, you know. Status profile is also complicated, and quantity offsetting is also complicated. These two are really complicated ones. Rest all are uh, pretty straightforward. No? Any questions on the uh, document? Uh, Controls, item controls. Hmm. Conceptually, you guys are clear, right? Why there is a need for a Z document type? There are n number of reasons in the project, right? A simple reason is a number range, or it could be status profile, uh, field control, incompletion. Okay. Okay, so we cross the difficult one, the, the complex theory. Uh, now, this is the one for decentral customer. All the controls are there, you know, the GR mode and other things are here at the business system level now. Okay, so when to co communicate the pick in and the pick denial communication and uh, pretty much all the, uh, you know, the interface uh, uh, bit from EWM to ECC, all the controls are there. Um, at which time you want to confirm the send the picking, the changes, the batch split, the delivery split, um, yeah, unit of measure split. Done. The unit one is completed. But uh, embedded and DWM for logic perspective works same way, right? So why there are only specific controls only for a decentralized? Because even for embedded also, it's a separate instance. So those controls will be applicable for embedded also. Yeah, those controls are applicable, but they have kept the, you know, uh, con control separately, uh, you know, uh, it's like, a, I would say like, uh, that's one major point, you know, uh, what happens, uh, it's all in central place for decentral customers, it's all at the business system One config node is there, you know, I, I couldn't show it in my system, you know, that's why I've taken a screenshot, I showed you the controls, there are some 30 plus controls are there, you know, just for a number sake, I'm taking a number, but in embedded, these controls are elter skelter, you know, they're kept in two, three places actually. Uh, one at the document type level, and the other one uh, uh, by an implicit body, you know, there is a default body. So some of the controls are moved to the body, and some are at the document type level, you know. And third place, I don't remember, it's not on top of my head, but yeah, it's moved in two, three places actually. So I can show it, you know, in my uh, system being an embedded system. So you mean to say those controls are applicable for both embedded and decentralized? It's just uh, there is a copy of the configurations. They are available uh, at multiple places. Multiple places. That's a problem with the embedded. You know, it's not in one place. And one good news is uh, it is not at the business system level. Business system means you know uh, the control. Uh, if you can't say for uh, one particular document type, you can have GR mode one. Another document type, you can have GR mode two. That is difficult. You know, there is a workaround. It is not a, it is not a, you know, a dead end. Still, there is a way around. But here it's straightforward, you know, because uh, you do it at the, uh, you do it at the uh, document type level. See, we go to the process management control. 
yeah that is one more profile you know process management profile process management and control so this is where uh, uh, this is where you know some of the controls are there for example the gr mode is there okay and then the communication to erp is there um uh, most of the things are in the body you know so you need to uh, do the, some something you know custom development if if you want to you know make it a uh, varo specific or you know plan specific uh, in that case you need to do something otherwise uh, uh, if you want to do uh, you know override for example if i make any changes here you know um if i make any changes here at least it will show me uh, which is standard and which is uh, the uh, one which you touched uh, by by color code you know it's a smart configuration see here uh, mm -hmm. whatever i change from the sap standard uh, it will show as a red color you know these are the mm -hmm. things we know that we have modified um, mm -hmm. so if you take this one nothing great about it batch controls are there and then the inbound delivery controls are here and outbound delivery controls are there and this is a non delivery interface uh, the direct posting like scrap in or you know the goods issue posting uh, or uh, physical inventory things are here and then these are the general one the goods ship mode is here and uh, you know uh, the vendor if he is providing uh, duplicate as and whether to block it or not or other things but if you look at the control here i think uh, the duplicate should be here also you know a uh, unique as and number is there and communicate to erp only three items are here remaining things i am not sure i prepared some other document i can you know uh, search for that actually but just keep in mind uh, uh, in this central it's all in one place uh, but the only drawback is we need to know uh, how to make it uh, for individual document type being at the global control business system level if you want final control you need to do some development on the other hand uh, the embedded it's in multiple places it's a good good question you raised uh, bipin the right time makes sense so. yeah i mean unless we have hands on we can really compare that what is where i mean this looks to be quite clumsy uh, it's not quite clumsy complex, but yeah quite clumsy it's there here and there but you know it's a good news actually so if it's all in one place also it's uh, easy for everyone so they kept it i don't know why they're doing it. see if i go to the ewm uh, decentral i don't think i can access it where is the oh, that, that, that node itself will not be there uh, erp integration so if i go to this one no erp integration to decentral i don't think i can access this it says that there is no business for you okay um right so next uh, chapter interesting chapter now um need more attention uh, for this one so so far the summary of unit 1 is you know what why you know what's so great about ewm and you know comparison of ewm and wm and also we did the deployment options uh, and then we jump to the document uh, integration and then the system integration right that's about the unit 1 any questions on unit 1 before we move to unit 2 high level only you know feel free shar datta is quite today i no no question madam okay all right so the next thing what we can do is uh, the unit number 2 which is um, org elements the organizational elements the structural elements the building blocks foundational blocks whatever you call them you know so it's all used for designing the warehouse you know uh, by looking at the configuration uh, one should be able to visualize the warehouse you know without even visiting the you know sweden or the denmark or uh, finland yeah so you should be able to visualize the warehouse layout that's a good design you know so you should use the sap standard um, uh, you know naming convention and um, and also you know a uh, copy of the original one so that you know it will be easy for any new consultants who are joining the project and that is one part of the story and the second one is really you know you should uh, maximize the uh, usage of uh, you know the storage type uh, and not to be confused with the uh, storage type versus section or you know or storage type versus warehouse number so these are important you will gain more experience you know uh, 
based on your implementation experience. So, so now, you know, right, the plant and storage location uh, uh, assigned to the intermediate warehouse. Uh, intermediate warehouse is a technical requirement, you know, like a relay race, carrying the baton and giving it to the, you know, final runner. So that's a, a because one system to another system, we need uh, one one uh, entity to, you know, uh, marry the two seamlessly. So your uh, plant, we know everything about the plant. This is the highest logistics org unit, uh, operational facility within the company. Uh, it subdivides the uh, enterprise um, from the material planning, procurement, production, or maintenance standpoint. One plant corresponds to one company. These things you know. One plant cannot belong to multiple company code. Most importantly, plant has a unique address and zone. So the plant, we don't care. You know, in EWM, we don't have plant. So instead of plant, we have location and, uh, you know, the address is brought by the supply chain unit. Um, and location, I told you, location also, we don't care. You know, it's just for uh, uh, road determination and, you know, creating the legs and the route only. Otherwise, you know, it's not required. Uh, the location, uh, we don't care. A uh, storage location, you know, right? The aggregated stock is maintained there. Um, and it, the, for example, there are um, uh, like astral pipe, you know, or phenolex uh, is dealing with many things now, you know, the tanks, the UPVC, the CPV, CPVC, whatever, right? Um, pipes. And also is getting into nowadays the uh, interior uh, furnishing items also. So now uh, you would be having different uh, warehouses or storage types of buildings. So all mapped to individual storage locations in ECC. Otherwise, SAP recommends uh, to keep the storage location um, to the necessary uh, requirements only. For example, one for ROD, the other one for AFS, maybe a third one for uh, production supply area, production staging, and fourth one for uh, you know transportation cross docking as part of the template warehouse. Uh, but if somebody says I am uh, having single plant and I am running 20 storage locations mapped to the EWM project means, it's something fishy, you know, something um, uh, really the guy, uh, yeah, it's, it just needs some um, quality audit. Yeah. Uh, but my, my simple uh, point, what I'm trying to make is uh, the location should be kept bare minimum. Of course, you know, if the ECC guys, they want to see the stocks in a different bucket, uh, there is a genuine need. For example, the quality stock or the customer research stock, they want to see them. You have to give the location, you know, Otherwise, uh, there is no need to create more locations uh, within the plant. Okay, then the intermediate warehouse, nothing great about it. Just the ECC warehouse and, uh, you know, with the description. And that's where we activate the flag, you know, EWM or uh, whatever. Then um, any questions on this slide? Um, Mm. Oh, fine. All fine. All right. Now, there are multiple options we know, right? Um, multi plant single warehouse. Yeah, multi plant single warehouse or single plant multi warehouse or dedicated plant warehouse. You know, these are the three combinations. We say SPSW, MP, SPMW, MPSW. MPMW means it's ridiculous. Huh? So this is a single plant, single warehouse, and this single plant, multi warehouse, a huge plant, I know, catered by multiple warehouses, or a huge warehouse catering to multiple plants. And the other way, right, multi plant, single warehouse. And then this is a simple one, dedicated plant warehouse, the first one. Okay, this we saw, right? Uh, the business suite customers, the classical customers, uh, they are contemplating, you know, uh, in a uh, typical, you know, long duration project. Uh, some of the viruses will still be running in WM, while some of them migrated to S4 Rana. Some still in the classical world, you know, that's where they are migrating to S4 Rana. Maybe uh, one or two viruses already implemented S4 Rana, and some are in lean WM, some are in IM. Some could be in DWM as well. And some are, you know, managed by uh, uh, 3PL or, you know, the automated systems or whatever. And this we slide we talked about on the other day. Um, the WM and the uh, customers are pushed to the corner. Now either they can take the stock room management and not to bother SAP, or they can take the basic license of embedded or the advanced license of embedded. Or if they are already a classical customer, so they will use the migration tools. These guys also have the migration tools, you know, the WM guys also. 
and the classical guys also have migration uh, path to move to S4 Rana seamlessly. Um, so normally they are expected to move to S4 Rana decentral, but also I told you nowadays, you know, the recent release, uh, there is a migration path available to move to embedded as well, you know, advanced normally. Any questions on this slide? You have a comparison slide on stock room basically in advanced. <laughs> Which one? The embedded basic and advanced? Yeah, this three one stock room basic and advanced. Right? From licensing perspective, this three different right? stock room is three basic. You have to pay for that. And then uh, advanced, uh, maybe another uh, package. So is there yeah. a functionality difference comparison? No, this is an object difference. You know, this is using the TOTR, you know, the traditional WM objects. Here it is using the EWM objects, you know, the task and order and uh, it, this is much better, you know, it, this is an old way of doing things, you know, just many, many, many functionalities removed. Like the VAS, the cross talking, they are not supporting, you know, the TRM all removed from stock from the WM, that is stock room management. WM minus uh, many things is equal to stock room management. But this basic EWM is much better, right? This is a, a more, uh, you know, forward looking. This is just if your uh, business is, uh, planning to close the shop maybe you'll just run it you know without with just basic thing just like a, a storeroom that's why you say stock room storeroom or whatever uh, from licensing perspective you said that basic ewm has to be paid separately than the other uh, than no no i store. didn't say basic ewm um, is part of s4 or no advanced ah, okay. only you have to pay yeah advanced okay so when you say advanced uh, at least is there comparison don't you get explained the advanced Sorry, advanced. I mean, what, what what do you get in advanced uh, by paying for the extra license? Um, yeah, the basic things also they are keeping in advance, you know, so you have to pay the money. <laughs> Some basic things like wave management also is in advance, you know, I can't imagine. This is a old slide, maybe, you know, it's see, the basic is very basic. Inbound processing, uh, outbound processing, internal processing, physical inventory, reporting. That's it. But where is kitting? Where is you know wave management? Uh, you know cross docking. Where is building? Uh, deco slotting, multi-step things. Also, they are talking here. I don't think. Um... <coughs> Did you see a lot of use cases of multiple flow system, yard management, labor management, and uh, cross docking because? I know that they, they were existing in ACC also to some extent, but I never found any customer use cases for those. Oh, no, no. Not... Cross docking is very common. Cross docking mm. and uh, kitting and, you know, the vast activities are very common. But the yard management, the yard logistics also nowadays, you know, very popular. Forget about the yard management. Yard logistics itself, people are implementing, you know, the Dubai uh, container yard or, you know, even the Singapore... Um, all the container terminals, you know, all the complex container things, the yard logistics is uh, getting implemented. And um, the automated projects are many, you know, MFS uh, automation is there uh, since 2010, I would say. All the biggies, you know, uh, they have moved to MFS. Uh, but now there are uh, uh, many robot integration things are also happening because people don't want to uh, invest money on the fixed infrastructure like the conveyor or the cranes, you know, so they're betting more on the Rather than putting the conveyor and you know they take a least warehouse and then run the robots and then do the job. Even the drones. Right. Hmm? Even the drones, drones are yet to, I don't know. Drones is just for moving from one end of the Amazon warehouse to another end of the Amazon warehouse. But otherwise, drones are uh, some people are crazy, you know. They talk about the physical inventory by sending a drone and mm. taking the picture and decoding mm. the picture and blah blah mm. blah. Mm. Yeah. Anyways, all good news. So now this is a product process flow. Uh, you could see a uh, typical warehouse. This is a warehouse. Um, so for freshers or starters, you know, like you see, there's a door and then there's a TU, transportation unit, dock, dock to the door. Okay. And then we do the unloading. This is a staging area where we do the many things, you know, visual inspection, um, sorting them, maybe uh, applying some label or doing some activities also here. If there is no dedicated work center, then you will do it here. Or if there are dedicated work centers, then you do it on the table. Uh, and then you do the put away. So this is the put away. The, all the good to go pallets are taken by the forklift and then they do the put away. 
put away in this uh, rack storage, uh, you know, this may be assumed as a receiving from production. The adjacent facility may be a production uh, warehouse. And then you receive the finished goods on the conveyor. And then um, this could be a sensor, you know, detecting the ID point. That's called ID point. So the ID point is detecting the, uh, you know, the shape, the size, the projections, and uh, before giving it to the crane. If it's not properly checked, then the, there could be a potential accident. So uh, we need to uh, use the sensor to detect all the things and the handshake happen taken to put away. If the problems detected, then it will be returned back to production for rework. Um, here you pick the things and then you know put it on the conveyor and then it comes and then gets dropped to different route, you know, or different other ways of consolidation. And you, these guys are the ones consolidating them and then moving it to the staging area, goods issue staging area, and this is GR staging area. So directly, if we are moving something that is called cross docking and uh, load it, goods issue it. Outbound simple pick, pack, stage, load. So here you see, this is the TU, the top view or the plan. So you do the unloading step number one, and then you move it to the deco workstation. Maybe this is a mixed HU, you know, having multiple items. The items needs to be separated, you know, because uh, each one going to different um, activity area or uh, different, you know, consolidation group. Uh, in fact, this should be read as a deconsolidation group. Uh, so we need to deconsolidate them. Uh, that is the signal uh, system knows that something needs to be deconsolidated because uh, the destination bins are having different uh, uh, DCG group, you know, group number one and group number four. So that means it knows that, okay, the pallet cannot be stored directly. The mixed pallet, if you are allowing to store in the bin, then there is no need for deco. The things would be dynamically evaluated. You know, the POSC is dynamically evaluated. Uh, it is not that you put in the step one, two, three, it will go blindly, no. It will dynamically evaluate. If the product is subjected to quality, meaning the master data is maintained, then only it will route it to the quality station. Otherwise, it will skip the quality station. Similarly, if the pallet is a um, mixed pallet is allowed in the final bin, there's no need for uh, deco. Uh, are you guys following? Hmm? So for deco, uh, the existence of source issue is important, but if that source issue has come from the vendor and you have no existence in your system, uh, that deco is from the vendor, right? I mean, you can, can't record that uh, source issue which has come from the vendor. Sorry, the source issue coming from vendor. Is yeah, yeah I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I'm saying that deco steps looks it, it's optional, right? Because if it has come from your other, other stuff, like a stock replenishment or the HT order from production, uh, then it is fine. Then it is in, within your system. But it, if it has come from the external vendor, then the yeah, external has, vendor yeah. is sending assortment of items, you know, put in a huge cage or a huge pallet, you know, assortment of items. But you can't store them, you know, you got to separate them. You I know, I know. Uh, them and uh, yeah, yeah, I understood that. But I'm saying that. We are not uh, acknowledging that source issue that has come from the external vendor, right? Because it has no existence in your system. We might call it as a ABC pilot, right? For you, it, it does not mean anything unless you build the issue on your own. Yeah, correct. Uh, it is just a ABC shared in the ASN, or it could be like a, a, there's some concept called a material unknown, you know? So, we have something collective with you, or there's, there's a concept actually, you know, uh, I, I would explain that. So meaning you don't know the contents, you know, you just receive them and then take it to a proper station and then you create the actual issues, you know, there's a mm -hmm. concept uh, available. So you don't know the contents, you know, you blindly do the thing, the complete uh, truck load, you form mm -hmm. a wrapper HU or I, I want a better term, you know, I don't know, like, let me see the term, you know, what is the big deal? Nest, nested. Not nested HU. HU unknown and there is a concept called HU unknown. There is a another HU two different HUs. Said is there? Said maybe knowing this. It's fine. I mean, yeah, I thought yeah. that. I mean, so the depot is more of the... yeah. Rajan, Rajan. Hey, you know that other uh, collective HU, the concept like there is something called you know we don't know the contents that there in the HU. You take it on the face value. This is the one. 
uh, HU unknown content, you know, HU is unknown content. Yeah. Uh, no, Rajan, I'm not aware. Okay. So it's unknown to you uh, also. Okay. So create HU with unknown content. This is the one, you know, you're talking Bipin. Yeah. All right, so that, that's a different concept actually. Yeah, yeah, align to this, you know, but deconsolidation is not only mixed HU, you, you need to separate them. As I said, you know, for example, you need to take some uh, sample inspection that is deconsolidation. And also mm. you need to, uh, you know, do the cross docking for partial quantity. You want mm. to take it to a work center and then take the required mm. quantity for cross docking and the remaining you want to put away. That mm. is also deconsolidation. Uh, and mm. the classical example is, you know, imagine a huge, uh, uh, cage, you know, four by four by four, four feet by four feet by four feet cage, you know, and uh, I have the example, you know, the BHP, the stock coming from Linfox, you know, Linfox is the uh, uh, 3PL or the uh, uh, the guy who is doing the on-site receiving, they do the checking and other things, they drop all the small parts, you know, for the um, service parts, all the small service parts in a huge container and they send it to the BHP uh, hub barrels. Then from there, uh, what happens, they do the sorting. Uh, meaning from the huge cage, they put them in trolley, individual trolleys, you know, trolley A is bound to destination A, you know, meaning aisle one, two, three, trolley B is going to aisle C, D, E. So they do the sorting activities. That is a classical deco. Deco is used for sorting. Mm -hmm. mm. So deco, I can talk about seven or eight scenarios, you know, deco is a, uh, without deco, you know, we are handicapped. Mm -hmm. All are big areas, man, deco, quality inspection, VAS, all three are major areas by itself. You know, VAS is a huge one. Uh, deco is also, you know, many people think that only deco means, a, you know, a mixed HU scenario only. They can't, uh, they can't come out other than that scenario, actually. Yeah. Now. Okay. It's 1025. Let's take a break before getting into the EW morgue elements. Let's take a break for 10 minutes and 10.35 will start, you know, for the in, EW model. In, yeah. in, in hmm? the traditional Dublin, uh, we had some of the good functionality in like uh, this warehouse rack balancing so that it should not topple for safety purposes or not. Uh, I mean, warehouse used to, strategies used to take care of that automatically so that you know the even loading. Uh, hmm. I believe that in EWM also that would be CLSP. Taken care, right? We're talking about CLSP. I don't know about uh, the acronyms, but yeah, I mean, it used to actually ensure that you have even loading so that not just the one part of the warehouse gets uh, loaded okay, and okay, it okay. might get toppled. It will not topple, no. That's what one uh, one guy was criticizing me when I said it's a one sided loading. He was saying, hey, it's not going to topple, right? It's not going to topple. It's not going to turn topsy turvy or something. I said, okay, yeah, it's not going to turn or topple. But imagine, you know, you're taking a 5 BHK apartment and exactly. all the family members are using one bathroom or yeah. one sitter. What is the yeah. fun, man? You know, I just yeah. gave a counter to the, the client actually, you know. That <laughs> but you have that in the EWM also, right? I mean, the strategies uh, take care of that. Yeah, CLSP, that's called CLSP, cross line stock placement. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think the uh, I just need one clarification. Uh, when we say we have uh, basic as well as advanced uh, versions of EWM embedded. embedded. Embedded options. So, uh, can we say that whatever the functionalities we are getting in the advanced embedded are equivalent uh, with the decentralized, or there are also uh, two parts of it in the decentralized one? I told you, right? There's a guide, RIN, whatever, right? There's some um, slight uh, issues with the parity, you know. Otherwise, I, I would say 95% or more than that, you know, uh, it's all the same features, same functions. But for example, the TCD, transportation cross docking, it's only supported in decentral, you know. Similarly, the synchronous posting only supported in the embedded, obviously, because, you know, these two are different environment in decentral. Likewise, you know, there are very minimal uh, things that there. Some you can't do. For example, embedded is not built for uh, multi ERP or multiple EWM system, no. And uh, similarly, decentral is not bent for uh, synchronous postings, you know. So, other than that, there are some functionality like TCD, you know, and the QM integration. Uh, there are a lot of uh, variations uh, compared with the embedded advanced to the decentral. Uh, sort of QM is lagging. Uh, the embedded QM is lagging, um, but but embedded QM is having more 
advantage in production integration uh, because of thanks to synchronous postings, you know, so very minimal system communication, simple communications. So people will normally go for embedded if you are a production customer, automotive customer, and you know, the manufacturing happening, happening in the adjacent warehouse and they are going for API scenario, advanced production integration, and uh, mostly synchronous postings and a deck of you know data duplication and uh, queue monitoring and other things are not required then you go for embedded nowadays you know since you are buying the uh, tech infrastructure from the uh, cloud provider right the azure and the aws so it makes sense to go for embedded unless and until you have some other giant modules you want to keep them and regional warehouses uh, automated warehouses so then you can think of these central Okay, so now I'm sharing my screen. So before uh, talking about theory too much, I don't want to do too much overload. So now I just go to the exercise. Uh, so you guys managed to get the uh, GUI logon pad or uh, it will take time? Because I checked with my guy, it will uh, be provided, you know, this uh, either today or tomorrow, I'm not sure. So what happened in your case? Uh, you have initiated the SAP GUI request or? Hmm? Huh? Mm, I think we understand that uh, vendor, I mean, parent tech will be providing the access. That's what mm. we understand. Parent tech will provide what the? The access to the system. No, no, what I mean to say, you know, access to the system has to be provided by me only. And uh, no, I mean, log on pad or remote desktop or something like that. No, no, log on pad uh, you can install, you know. Uh, that's a challenge. <laughs> that's a challenge, right? Yeah. Okay. So, is work started or for approval or still not at place? Challenge remains as a challenge, not questioned or not processed, you know. Not not at least probably not started. Okay, you're not started. Okay. Okay. So these are the exercises. You know, let me just take. Uh, um, so the first one you can ignore. You know, this is a tool-based wizard. So I'll just run through this. You can ignore them basically. So these are uh, designed for the virtual world only. You know, not like the regular SAP training material. Uh, you need to write it down and you know, uh, yeah. Here, uh, what I'm saying, uh, wherever the symbol, right, uh, ash, ash, you need to replace with your group number. For example, 01 is Bipin, 02 is, uh, you know, Charu. So likewise, you know, you did just need to repeat the last two uh, digits only. And um, the tool-based wizard not to be used, uh, just, just to see, uh, like, you know, I'm going to show you. I told you the prerequisite we need to check. All of us are having two locations, RD, uh, uh, whatever the group number and AFS. And then uh, you uh, ensure your warehouse number is there. Okay, EXX, uh, or in my case, I'm going to use E14. Just I'm going to, you know, do as a participant only now. And, um, and then this is where we activate the flag, right? And, um, and the tool, you're running the tool. And the tool is just having six steps only, six or seven, eight steps only. Let me just uh, zoom in. Okay, so you give a meaningful name, uh, your warehouse number, and then the, uh, you know, just a uh, integration setup. And then here we select the, um, uh, this is a, the ECC uh, uh, logical system, and this is the EWM dummy system. So the step number two, you are selecting the system. I told you, even for embedded, we need a dummy logical system. So this is the dummy logical system for EWM. See, non-exist dummy. And this is the ECC one. That is step number two. Step number three is uh, you are selecting the advanced function or the basic one. So we have advanced license. So we, we select the extended functions. And then here we marry the intermediate variables to the main variables, right? Uh, EW01 and E01 in your case, in Bipin's case. Okay, various def uh, definitions. And then here, the fourth step is org unit. Uh, SAP comes out with the 
standard uh, naming convention for the supply chain unit. If you want, you can change it, you know, SCU dash if you want, not underscore, you can do it. Uh, that's a step number four for, for creating the supply chain unit and um, or assignment of supply chain unit. The supply chain unit, uh, some prerequisites are there, you know, in order to run the tool, you need to uh, have some entries, like for example, the you have to create the intermediate barrows and so, and finally you do the stock type mapping for uh, two locations, we need to map the stock types. Uh, SAP traditionally go with the even odd concept, the even number for ROD and the odd numbers for the, uh, you know, second location, the AFS location. But I would recommend, uh, for example, F1 series for uh, ROD and the two series for, uh, you know, the other AFS location and maybe three series for one more location like the production supply area. Yeah, likewise, you know, if I have some five locations, story locations, then you can have uh, F1, F2, F3, F4, F5 within the plant only. But if the plant is different, then obviously, you know, you can uh, repeat the same stock type. Um, so don't worry about the stock type. As of now, you know that uh, there are four stock types, right? Global, global stock type, unrestricted, uh, quality, blocked, customer return. So the stock mapping is there. And then finally, the number range. Uh, number range, if you want to copy it from the template varrows, it's OK. And that's it. You know, Visa is nothing great. And um, if you don't want to do the Visa, yeah, I, I would recommend not to do this one. E1, we can skip the exercise number one. E1 is exercise number one. You can skip it. Um, then E2, directly, you can go and verify. Uh, if it's not there, you manually maintain it. Actually, E2 is just the outcome of E1. You know, after you run the tool-based Visa, uh, E2 will be the step to verify. But in your case, uh, since you're not running E1, because E1 needs uh, a NetViewer business plan and other thing. But anyway, tool-based wizard is for the, uh, uh, yeah, it's better to go in a direct mode and then do it, check and do it if uh, not maintained. So first thing you're checking the EWM varrows number, your number is there or not, EW0102 all the way to 13. And then here, uh, there are some procedures copied at the various number level. And uh, the assignment of uh, intermediate varrows to the main varrows, uh, assignment of intermediate varrows to the main varrows. Then uh, we check the storage locations, um, uh, both the location map to the availability group. In fact, we in, in this template varrows, I have three location, uh, one ROD, one AFS, and one production supply area. So I have three availability group. Uh, availability group is just an um, uh, intermediate entity, same like your material type linked to the valuation class uh, through what? Material type is linked to the valuation class using uh, what is account it called? Account category reference. Uh, account category mm -hmm. reference. Similarly, the availability group is the one which is an intermediate uh, entity, uh, which is marrying them to the stock type because you can't imagine one table, uh, you know, with all the entries. So that's why, you know, there is a two table approach. Uh, First table one is uh, mapping the lock, S lock to the availability group. And the second table is uh, mapping the availability group to the stock type. Uh, and stock type, why stock type in AWM? Because there is no location. And stock type uh, gives two dimension. One is the type of stock. And the second dimension is the storage location. So it's more aligned with the APO, you know, rather than uh, keeping the ECC storage location. Uh, this is the one I was talking, table number two where the availability group in turn mapped to the stock types. So availability group is mapped to the stock type. Then um, uh, we just need to say whether it's an advanced function enabled or not. And finally, the SCU supply chain unit in the index screen. Uh, wherever the index screen, you could see the yellow folders, uh, the easy access screen or the index screen. And if it's not mentioned, that means IMG configuration. Um, then finally, we marry the varrows to the supply chain unit. It's a one-to-one -one assignment. That is exercise number two. Okay. Uh, exercise number three, uh, we know the delivery prerequisite. Yeah? So the delivery prerequisite we know, right? Uh, you generate the model, distribution model. You go to this IMG node and uh, generate the distribution model for your intermediate varrows by giving the logical uh, dummy system, dummy EWM system. Um, then you should have all these BAPIs. And if you want to verify them, you can go to BD64. 
and then verify your varus is added or not you know uh, and then split criteria by varus number this is the one to avoid a mixed bag scenario uh, anyway for the delivery type we have already maintained just for your varus you need to activate it and then and finally the confirmation control key so that completes exercise number 3 and uh, from 4 onwards uh, first we we'll complete the 2 and 3 you know i'm going to run parallelly I, let me take uh, e14 varus i have allocated up to you know ew0 uh, ew13 so now i'll take ew14 and i will try to do that um, so the first step is uh, i'm checking one by one just just watch me closely uh, assignment um logistics execution where is number to plan test lock so if i am taking e14 selection by contents where is number e14 it's there you know i have two location rod afs location uh, assigned to the e14 where is that's good that means location is there and then the where is number is there assignment is there okay the next step is i go to the logistics uh, execution ewm integration basic settings configure ewm attributes then for e14 i just need to say it's a ewm managed and press enter and distribute immediately and batch determination and also serial number uh, delivery changes also allowed qrfc uh, yeah serial number capabilities now i save this then Okay, the next one is I got to generate the distribution model. You know, so distribution model. Uh, I just put E one four, and I give the dummy system. So don't don't change the logical system. This is your uh, dummy logical EWM system, and this is your uh, ECC system. These two are not used. These two are not used. So I take the dummy one EWM one, and. Uh, i told you for a given landscape we can have only one model active you know we cannot have two models so there's only one model available uh, awm and if you want to check the entries you can check whether it's there or not it says no entries there maintained so uh, if you want to create the entries you can create the entries normally normally this is a cutover activity so you will not have access to this production node so you got to you will not be doing it you know maybe in the test environment or quality environment you can do this but not in a production environment in the so production environment i'm doing it in the test environment so it's okay all the bappies are there so you just activate them but but in a production environment you will have the transaction code access to bd64 so you go there and go in change mode and uh, so here uh, you can go one by one and uh, insert your varus number you know this is already inserted now 14 Uh, in a prediction if you want to do this activity then you just uh, click on this and then insert a row and then add the varus number you have to do one by one for each bappy are you guys following hmm? yeah sir yeah okay so this is a cutover activity you know or uh, every system uh, you have to do it um, So if you have the access, you can run that uh, report. If you don't have the access, you go to BD sixty four and do it. So done. Uh, what other steps I have to do? E two I verified and E three delivery prerequisite. So the delivery split I have to enable. So the delivery split is here. I go to SPRO and it's part of LE logistics execution shipping. deliveries uh delivery split criteria okay, here so for my varus number e14 i activate the split okay create new request is a tcs uh may 2023 batch So last time, so June two thousand twenty-two. Mm. 
by Azure and take care. Okay, so this is a May 23 batch. Huh? Okay, save it. Done. Next thing is, um, anyway, the delivery type, uh, it's there. Normally we use EL for inbound and uh, LO or LF for outbound. Yeah, all are active, so okay, no worries. The next thing is, um, if confirmation control key, we want to be defaulted. So the better you do it here. So I just copy the uh, RD, uh, RD whatever 07, and I just do it for my whereas RD 14. Done. So it's easy one, right? This, the exercise number two and three are, you know, sort of LKG exercises only. Okay. Uh, you can do it in uh, five minutes time. I told you the E1, you can skip it because you need the NetWeaver and um, for that you need to add one file to the directory and you know, it will be difficult if you are using the company laptop. So, but I'll show you the path in EWM. Here it's uh, integration interface, ERP integration. This tool based is only for, uh, only for embedded customer. You know, this one is for basis and the other one is for uh, functional. So if you go here, you need to run the, maybe I'll try to overwrite it, you know. So it launches a NetWeaver uh, thing. All right, so you need to create a data set. Let me just take one data set, existing one. For example, E14, E14 INT. And then I just uh, keep going. Enter valid transport request. So I have to enter a transport request. Maybe I have to, you know, just I'll pretend, you know, I'll just create a new one. Then it will ask for a request. So then I can load it in the TCS May 23 batch. Then I'm not going to save it. I'm just going to back off, but I will navigate the steps and, you know, highlight it to you so that you get a feel of it, you know. So I told you, you need to select the ECC uh, uh, logical system and then the EWM system here, dummy one, and then say next. And here the Varos number should have been there already. So you just need to create a Varos number beforehand. Uh, I can take the 14 only, you know, so EW14. And, um, and then this is a ECC one, the E14. Okay, keep moving. And here you say basic or extended one. Okay. Then, then this is a supply chain unit. I'm not sure whether it's a proposal or uh, you know you can modify them or yeah. So the custodian and the default party and title to dispose should be there, and it will uh, pick it from there. The next one is the availability group mapping. So for RD14, I can map them to uh, uh, availability group one and unrestricted F2. Sorry, F1. Stock in quality inspection Q3, block stock is B5, and customer return stock is R7. So 1357, you know, that's the approach SAP is taking. Scrap is also there, S5. Uh, there's an additional stock type in EWM. Uh, nonetheless, it is the same block stock in ECC. Yeah? And uh, then I go to the other location, AS14, the availability group, 002. And then here it's all the F2, uh, Q4, uh, B6, R8. All right. And then this is S6 or something, scrap six. So just mapping the, uh, you know, stock types to the uh, storage location, thanks to the availability group, same like your account category reference. Uh, next number range, if you want to keep it, otherwise you can go explicitly and maintain them can skip the number range also, not a problem. Finally, you need to activate it, you know. So all the table entries are populated. Uh, you know, what are the table entries populated? I showed you, you know, in the PPT. Those are the table entries populated after running the visa. Uh, that's what access to you are going and verifying them. In our case, since we will not have access to this uh, NetWeaver business client, uh, you can directly do the access number two. If the entries are not there, you can maintain them. So leave the page and uh, access number three is done. Now let's keep moving. Any other questions before I start the theory? Hmm? 
So, so far we have completed two and three only. I am, I am mimicking by taking a virus number uh, EW14. You know, It's all clearly given. It has gone through some uh, four or five uh, training iterations. So hopefully there shouldn't be any bug, but yeah, there could be bugs also. I appreciate if you could uh, you know, identify any bug or misunderstandings, uh, I can correct the document. Uh, Bepin, Charu, others, uh, Vikas, Gagan, all good? Yeah. Okay. So it's more about practice only, you know, whatever you learn, you need to, just need to put them in, especially EWM system. Now, E3 is completed. Let's go move on. Now the next topic is the org element. Um, so we know the ECC element or the LE element, plan, storage, location, uh, shipping point, and uh, uh, company code, of course. Now the LE elements are the one where the intermediate warehouse is uh, connected to the main warehouse. And then underneath, we have the storage type, section, bins. Bin is, of course, a master data and activity area. Activity area can be compared to your picking areas of EWM. But otherwise, storage type section and bins are not a new concept. If you are a WM guy, these are the same old uh, things only, you know. And quant. What is quant, anyone? Mm -hmm. Existence of the uh, stock within the bin uh, grouped as per the criteria, like stock type and uh, SLED and all that. Mm. Superb. Excellent. That's a point. The existence of a material in a bin is called quant. If the bin is empty, that means there's no quant. And quant is unique, you know. It's like, like globally, we have how many quants now? 7 billion or 8 billion people are there, right? In the world, how many are there? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. So that each human being is a quant, you know, unique attribute, you know. The only difference is in the real world, you can't add to the existing quant or the next empty bins only. So every soul gets a new, new quant number. So likewise, you know, in EWM, the quant is differentiated by a, a material batch, a stock type or, you know, special stock, a plant code, a party and detail to dispose. Or, or if any deviating thing is there, that means there are two quants. For example, in a bin, there are um, two batches. That means two quant. Here, uh, the HU acts as an intermediate layer, you know, in a bin, there is a HU and then within the HU, you are having the quant. This is a HU quant and this is a normal quant. But keep in mind in EWM, we don't have the quant number, like in ECC, a dynamic number getting generated every time. In uh, EWM, we don't have quant number, okay? Uh, if you go and see uh, 10 records in a bin, that means 10 quant. If you see only one record, that means only one quant because the entity gets merged. The attributes being same, uh, the addition to stock happens, uh, potential addition to stock happens. If the attributes are different, uh, attributes or parameters are different, then obviously, you know, it will stay as a different quant, provided uh, mixed settings are allowed, you know, multiple uh, uh, combinations are allowed in the bin or not. It's based on the mixed controls. Um, so let's not go much on the quant. Now let's talk about the varus number. Any questions on this uh, high level? The storage type section, bin is a master data and activity area. Now, what is the difference between HU quant and normal quant? Normal quant means a loose item sitting in the bin without any uh, HU. Okay. HU means in the cotton box, take this is a cotton HU. We have two different products in the HU in the in the cotton or two different batches, you know. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Now coming to the varus number, this is a four-digit alphanumeric. This is an entire complex, you know, the building or even adjacent building also, which are um, in the near vicinity, maybe in the same region or you know, same uh, supply chain unit. Um, uh, supply chain unit, if you could see, like like your uh, Google map. The location you are sharing, right? That is a supply chain unit. It has a latitude, longitude, and you know, uh, uh, positioning in the uh, in the in the geographical map. Yeah, that is a supply chain unit. So that's why we need to marry the supply chain unit to the warehouse number. And moreover, we don't have the plant. You know, if you have the plant, then the address is uh, available. But we don't have the plant um, object in EWM. Uh, 
being a EWM is a supply chain module. So we talk more on the networking and global aspects only. It's not an enterprise focused one. So there are four types of errors we know, broadly speaking. And uh, uh, that's where the global data is maintained, like the weight, the volume, you know, the time unit uh, and the calendar. So these are the information maintained at the warehouse number level. Uh, and there is no flag saying that this is a production warehouse or distribution warehouse. Normally in the implementation, uh, it could be one or, uh, you know, two possible, but maximum one, you know, if it's a production warehouse, it will not be a distribution warehouse. So if a client is running all different types of warehouse, then he might have a flag needed to report, you know, at the global level. But otherwise, you know, uh, you know, the nitty gritties of it, you know, if it's a service parts warehouse, you should have some skill set um, on the product uh, masters, you know, obsolescence and um, uh, kitting and, you know, serial numbers. Distribution warehouse means that they should be very uh, comfortable with the wave management, the WOCR things, shipping cockpit. Production warehouse, you know, right? It's all uh, manufacturing scenarios, DBA or APA or Kanban, just in time. So. Okay, so the, that's about the warehouse number. Any questions here? Hmm? Let me show you parallelly the warehouse number. So just go to the SPRO. Uh, EWM, EWM. I think for running the wizard, you just need to have the various number as a prerequisite, you know, uh, to run the wizard. Just a definition only, nothing great about it. Uh, but but after that, you need to go and assign the values, you know, various number control. Slowly, steadily, you need to add the entries. So let me check my various EW14. So I am talking in Euro, so Eurozone warehouse. I don't know why it's Europe. It's a Euro, US warehouse only, USD only. Anyways, so now the volume unit, uh, length unit, and time unit, you know, calendar, and then the, some special WPTs are maintained. Um, any idea what is WPT? The high level, you know. Anyway, we'll be discussing in detail. But what is WPT? Any EWM folks? Only Charu and who else is there? EWM. It's so a warehouse Hello? process type. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, which, Rashi. which, which is, it is a very important thing in uh, EWM, and it helps to determine the the staging area, staging bin, um, hmm. and it has a lot of other controls as well, like if for POSC, LOSC. There are different mm -hmm. controls over to that, and that can be determined based on the document type, PCI, and delivery priority. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Charu. Full marks, ten on ten. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Desh Pandey, <laughs> amazing guy. Amazing guy. Yeah. So the WPT. Let me put it in my words, you know, WPT is nothing but like a bus route. You know, you take a bus route, you reach a destination, right? Uh, you have to be careful, right? If you are taking the, from Silk Boat to Matali, you have to go take the inbound bus, you know, towards the airport. You want to take the outbound bus from airport, you have to take a bus, you know? So the, the bus route will determine whether it's going in which direction, whether it's a put away or picking or internal move or replenishment. Simple, that without WPT, you can't create task. That's step number one. And WPT will give the direction and it plays a key attribute in determining the staging area, as you said, and also the main bin, the destination bin. And WPT will call the brothers, you know, the brothers in blood uh, in a POSC scenario. It will call the unloading uh, WPT. The main WPT will call the other subordinate WPTs uh, in a POSC scenario. Without WPT, can you uh, complete the inbound? For example, I received some packaging materials, miscellaneous items, you know. I know for sure that it will be uh, bound to a room. I don't want to complicate by creating a task and other things. Do I still need a WPT in the inbound delivery? Hmm? I'm not sure. Again. Whenever we ask a question, uh, you say it is possible, you know, technically all possible in the world. So <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. It's almost, you know, 80% of the time you will uh, will be correct only. Technically, consultant possible. switch. 
<laughs> consult the pitch. <laughs> no, no, not consult the pre-sales pitch. <laughs> pre-sales pitch. <laughs> they'll pitch in and they'll ditch us actually. Now, that's all there. Okay. So meaning, there's no need to take a bus, right? If it's just known, uh, always go into a room, right? Nearby place. Why you take a bus, right? Just walk. That is also there, you know. So meaning an inbound can be completed without WPT. And since there is no WPT, it's implied that we don't need task. Okay. Some special WPTs are maintained here. For example, loading, unloading, you know, uh, unknown content, the issue with unknown content we talked about now. And, uh, you know, put back. Uh, the leftover mother palette can be placed at the end of the day or, you know, the next day in a big point area. Uh, some special WPTs you can imagine, you know, that's those are maintained here. And also some procedures are maintained, the pack specs procedures are maintained. So these are the control at the Vero's number level, I know. Okay, so these are important controls at the Vero's number level. And um, and I told you the Vero's, uh, we create a supply chain unit in the index screen, you go and check your uh, supply chain unit. Uh, always, you know, keep adding to your favorites, uh, but I will show you one time. Uh, logistics, uh, EWM, uh, master data, supply chain unit yeah so in my case so uh, your supply chain unit already there you know so i think only one got impacted 12 but you have to be careful you know 12 means you have to take this one not this one so 1008 means it's created a, um what to say plant manually created you know yeah it's a varrow's number 1008 is uh, varrow's number and 1001 is a plant i guess let me see 14 i have 1001 only so display um, so we need to put this attribute you know inv is most important and also you know normally this would be the receiving office and shipping office um, and if you're doing the uh, doc appointment scheduling you know then the planning location will be there or if you're doing the uh, you know route planning then planning location will come uh, i will I, i'm not sure the planning location but inv is the most important one saying that this is the warehouse and I told you the address is there, you know. Oh, this is California and talking neuro, interesting. Anyways, all, you know, great guys, they have done something, uh, given it to them. But yeah, so this is, a, you know, the supply chain is bringing in the latitude, the longitude, you see, all the latitude, longitude address. And the most important thing is the INV had to be added. And finally, we married the supply chain unit to the Varos number. So that marriage is your settings. Assign Varo's number to the supply chain unit. So this is important. You know the supply chain unit. Uh, let me just go to table view. EW fourteen. Uh, yeah, it's there. Supply chain unit assigned to the Varo's number. And uh, if there are multiple plants, for example, uh, multi-plant single Varo scenario, and one of the plant is the most frequently used, maybe eighty percent of the time is used then you don't want a manual typo entries, you know, so you just uh, remove, maintain that entry, you know. This is the default plant where you do, uh, let's say 90% of the time business. Very rarely uh, we do the other plant, you know, for example, 1710, 1711, both of them pointing to EW14. In that scenario, we can maintain the default. Uh, but if it's a 50-50, uh, then there is no need to maintain. But custodian is required. Uh, what is the difference between the custodian, the PED and the owner? Anyone? Hmm? Mm. Custodian is the one who owns the warehouse and uh, party entitled to dispose is the one who is entitled to dispose the goods. For an example, mm. uh, I have a warehouse. Mm. Um, I am the owner of the warehouse, so I'm a custodian and mm. I have given uh, some place to you, some place to be pinned, some place to gagan. So to keep your material and to dispose it from my warehouse. So you are a party entitled to dispose. Mm, superb. Again, 10 on 10. Okay, now, great. good man, excellent. Excellent. So this is the one, you know. So I take the example of Bax Global. You know, Bax Global used to be a 3PL in um, uh, Malaysia, you know. So the custodian is the Bax Global, who is a actual uh, guy who is operating the warehouse, you know, the 3PL. He is a Bax Global and he is the custodian of the warehouse. Okay. 
he is responsible for executing the deliveries and you know we pay him for the services he's doing 3pl means three third party logistics they could be 4pl also uh, i'm not sure 5pl also maybe so different uh, services they do you know like uh, even the customs clearing the you know the forwarding uh, carrier uh, arrangements and all that they do but mostly we are talking about the warehouse operations they are doing he is the one custodian of the warehouse like a watchman you know he is the one um, managing the warehouse and ensuring that the customer deliveries are processed on time that is a custodian then he is managing the three plant codes you know the clients for three uh, intel samsung and the amd so these are the three clients or you can call it as a plant or ped uh, and these are mapped as plant or it could be mapped as consignment also not a problem depending on how bax global is running the warehouse so for us they are the ped they are the one who can dispose the goods not only scrap don't assume that dispose means scrapping no shipping out to the customers you know so they are the ones who can decide where to ship whom to ship yeah ped 1 2 3 but just in case if uh, amd's vendor is there uh, he is directly keeping the goods as a consignment stock then the owner is the the amd vendor not the amd that is the only difference between owner and ped otherwise owner and ped are one and the same uh, just for the consignment scenario the real vendor who is keeping the goods as consignment is the real owner understood about the client the owner the ped the plant as bp huh? <laughs> Hi Rajan, uh, can you please uh, brief us a little bit like uh, how 3PL is different from decentralized warehouses? I mean, briefly 3PL. 3PL is a uh, as I said, you know, Vipin was asking me on the first day, right? So more and more people are focusing on the core competencies only, right? They're bothered or they are, you know, struggling to get the supply chain uh, issues, you know, because of Putin and others. So. so now people are focusing on their core activities only and more and more they are giving it to the experts actually you know they don't want to run the warehouse so this is all given to the 3pl you know 3pl means he is uh, managing the warehouse he is uh, you know ensuring that the deliveries are uh, done shipped to the customer on time every time you know without any errors that is 3pl you are outsourcing it to the 3pl and 3pl core competency like dhl or you know uh, fedex or whatever the mainly take dhl example you know is a 3pl so he is running the warehouses and he is having the 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 technology the iot is all the you know the experienced stuff and he can do a better job the dwm environment you are uh, ideally the 3pl if they are having their own uh, sap or you know the red prairie manhattan or blue yonder or whatever right then um, normally it would be connecting to the different uh, source systems you know in this case uh, it would be tying connecting to intel system samsung system and amd system and getting the data you know in the form of uh, inbound delivery or outbound delivery orders and all that he wants is the outbound delivery or inbound delivery so that he can do the pick pack ship load vas activities that's what he is doing either either intel can uh, create do the sap implementation and you know ask them to run the show right by giving the authorization to them or intel can blindly you know take the 3pl uh, software and then connect it and here they maintain as a you know im location the black box only they don't care at the end of the day they need to push the deliveries and if the deliveries are pga then all that they need to know is the communication back to trigger a material document uh, that helped or uh, we need still explanation then charu will jump in <laughs> who is it no that that's fine that's fine mayur this said mayur yeah mayur clear mayur yeah yeah clear actually in our project we have both the system decentralized and 3pl that's why we are confused mm-hmm. 3pl are the experts you know who know who can handle the things better than you guys you know than the regular client you know the client means like intel craft or whatever you know those are guys so they are not in the there are n number of other edx right so but still they may have a team and they can do all the uh, nonsense if they want yeah it's better to give it to the 3pl and uh, yeah if it's a huge operation complex operations if it's a simple operation uh, you can negotiate and you know still you can give it to 3pl all right so that's about the terms mostly these are applicable to the you know the lsp logistic service provider also the 3pl one and the same so that's where uh, these terms make sense uh, 
but otherwise, if you are uh, just a client doing on your own, then the PED is good enough. You know, are we talking about multiple plant or single plant enough? The custodian, you need not you know uh, go and shout. You are the custodian by default. You know, so no problem. Custodian is uh, very rarely seen in the monitor. It's not even available. You know, it's known that you know you are Charu and you know you know you Bipin. Right? There is no confusion unless you are uh, like uh, the Amir Khan movie or the Gajini movie. Right? So you have to write your number and let's say, okay, I am the custodian. Okay, any questions, guys, on the uh, uh, so far? Hmm. Rashi, Venkatesh, uh, because you guys are okay, all okay? Or uh, should I slow down, Chaitanya? Yeah, hmm. Interesting or uh, overwhelming or what? What is the feel? We don't turn on the camera, so we just want to get a feel of this. Uh, you guys, how do you feel? Uh, is it I'm rushing too much, or is it okay, digestible, or? Hmm? It's good. Uh, actually, we are from WM, so we know some some uh, parts. So yeah, it's uh, easy to understand the things. Hmm. What about others? Mayor Vikas uh, Chaitanya. All good. Okay, yeah, silence. I will take it as a you know approval and then. So whereas number is done, and then uh, supply chain unit. Uh, we, uh, yeah, tell me. What is your view? Is it uh, better for the WM guys to pick up PWM as the natural progression? Or I saw that there are people who do not have a WM experience and they just move to WM also because nowadays even freshers are also getting trained in WM. Uh, that also has an advantage because they don't come with a baggage and uh, the, like we always tend to actually compare what was in the WM before and uh, WM uh, if you know it is easy especially the put away strategies and rules it's uh, that's mm. where the advantage is there you know you know the structure you know you know straight away you get the you know advantage mm. uh, structure you know storage type section and the put away strategies and put away rules other mm. than that it's all a new concept only you know so the mm. guy who is uh, directly getting into EWM, he will be, you know, like uh, having some difficulty compared to the WM guys, but uh, it doesn't matter. But only problem he will face is, uh, you know, um, the scenarios only. You need to spend more time in knowing the, uh, you know, the MM, uh, the SD processes actually, integration, like for example, the item category determination, shipping point determination, those things if he knows, then he can, you know, collaborate effectively with the other, uh, other consultants, you know. And you should appreciate the scenario, you know, uh, when you talk about uh, the scenarios with the business persons in uh, mapping the solution, it's all scenarios only, you know, so we should not uh, get a complete picture, you know. Uh, for that, I've seen people struggling, those who directly jump into EWM without the MMSD or logistics uh, execution background, uh, they struggle a lot, you know, they have to put more effort. But if you are uh, already a WM consultant, uh, some advantage is there. But that advantage will uh, be, you know, gone once, uh, maybe after six months down the line or three months, both are on the same page only. WM, anyway, I told you, right, 15 uh, years, nothing happened, you know. So oh, what is happening in 2005, who cares, actually? You know? It's all waste. But by only put away strategy, 60% of, 70% of it is used. Removal strategy, yes. That's it. And that will take, you know, a month's time only to figure out for a newcomer. If they work as a nomadic coalition like a lines, then they can easily, you know, overcome the old lines like uh, me. <laughs> okay, any questions, guys? Supply chain unit is clear now. Okay, this is the one, right? I was talking about the the network perspective. It's bringing the the the, the geo coordinates yeah? supply chain unit. Uh, now you could appreciate there is a, no concept of plant. There is no concept of location in AWM. So plant as the BP, this is what you are, you know, fooling the system uh, by marrying the plant, uh, uh, by sending the vendor first or the customer first, and then, you know, piggybacking on that uh, P BP by, by assigning the plant code smartly, you know. So thereby we know he is the plant and, you know, for example, plant uh, 1710, the vendor code uh, BP 1710 and customer also BP 1710, you know. So for uh, all the three entities are married. So at the end of the day, we have three things only, you know, uh, right? With this, we have to wage the war. We have the F-35 and we don't have the spare parts. So that's a US situation. So we have only three things now, uh, storage type, 
section and bin. Okay. So these are the three things only. With this, we have to dish out many things, you know, uh, basic ingredients we have. Uh, storage type, you know, the green, the blue color. Section is the gray color. And the bin is the yellow or orange color, or yellow color, yeah. Any questions here? Uh, so now you see the door is here. And then the door is a uh, storage type. In EWM, each um, uh, storage type has a role to play, meaning the ABAP coding logic is written based on the role. You know, what role you are performing? Uh, you husband or a brother or a, you know, father or a grandfather, whatever role you are performing accordingly, you have to, you know, take position. Um, yeah. So likewise, you know, each storage type has a role to play. Uh, 9015 is a door role and 9010 is a staging area role. These are SAP provided naming convention. For example, if you are creating some GR areas, you better uh, say uh, 9010, you don't touch. Maybe you introduce some you know, G901, G9011, sorry, 902, 903 for all your inbound staging areas. Similarly, for all your outbound staging areas, you can say G91 series, you know, so that the people will know. That's what I meant by, you know, smartly using the four digit alphanumeric. Um, so the main storage are here, high rack storage and uh, fixed bin areas, uh, you know, the other are interim areas, like the packing work center, uh, the, all the work centers will have eight series and your staging areas will have nine series. Uh, door, of course, 9030, uh, outbound staging is 9020 and like your movement type, right? 101 for inbound, 201 for all issues, three for all uh, location to location moves or stock transfers or posting chain, four also for what? Five is the uh, unplanned ones and scrapping and other things. Similarly, we have nine zero for staging areas and eight zero for work centers. And the 10 all the way to 70 or 80 are the main storage. This is part of the template where uh, triple zero one. So inbound is clear. You receive the TU, you dock to the TU, and then we do the unloading to the staging area. And then we move it to the deco if required. And then from there, you do the put away to the IRAC or to the fixed bin. And from there, you pick it, pack it, stage it, load it. And if yard management is there, you do some yard activities like, you know, um, capturing the weight, uh, seal application, and, you know, uh, yeah, many things you can do in the yard, you know. Uh, main things are the capturing the weight and moving to the parking area if the doors are uh, busy and um, covering with the plastic sheet or whatever the tarpaulin sheet or something like that. Is there any questions on the structure understanding? Thirty more minutes. Um, no questions. All good. Yeah. So this is the most important one, storage type. Uh, storage type is a physical or logical subdivision of a warehouse. And uh, it's characterized by the TSO, technology aspects, the spatial aspects, the organization form or function. Uh, basically, group of bins, you know, with the, uh, some unique characteristics or, you know, common characteristics or attributes. That's storage type in a nutshell. Uh, the, the commonality, you, you have to decide, you know, that's where the experience will come. For example, here, the bin attributes uh, and bin level, for example, this is a different storage type, you know, the level zero and level one. Even though it is part of the same structure, but still the level zero and level one are different storage type. This is called pick face, you know. You are facing the uh, picking area because it's at the five feet level, you know. So it's easy to retrieve without any equipment. So this is called pick face location. This is a forward uh, picking area or pick face location based on the bin attribute and bin level, low level pick face. Product and packaging material attributes also. For example, this is a pallet storage. Uh, this is a cotton storage. And you know, this one is a each storage. So based on the pallet and packaging material, uh, put away and picking strategies like next empty bin, normally for rack storage, uh, bulk storage, pallet storage. This is a bulk storage. You know, you keep it normally on the floor area. And like a refrigerator or washing machine, you stack them one above the other. And then uh, you know, quickly issue them out. Uh, this not only for the you know the durable goods, but also for the uh, perishable items like you know milk or uh, croissants or you know the bakery products, um, the FMCG items. Uh, so you keep them uh, in a day or two, and then uh, you know get the hell out of there as much as you possible. It's very difficult to you know keep it on a bin and then 
you know, get a equipment and then bring it down and then issue it out. Rather, we use the floor area effectively. That is called bulk storage. It's called bulk storage. This is called a mezzanine storage, you know, where you keep the entire uh, plastic tote or cotton. You don't distribute the quantity, you know. Normally, in a mezzanine is a low level area. You don't carry any equipment. You just, uh, you know, uh, walk around and then pick the item and uh, bring it immediately for the less than pallet load. These are called pick phase location, you know, where you keep the fast moving items. Uh. So normally you replenish from behind and then, uh, you know, this lady is uh, going with the cart and doing the picking, maybe four more items. So once the cotton is completed, the next cotton will flow automatically, you know, by gravity. This is called a flow rack. So one of the pick phase location for faster picking, you keep the fast moving items either here in the flow rack or here in the low level pick phase. And you keep replenishing, you know, same like your uh, Ikea stores, you know, if you go into Ikea, then you might have noticed, you know, they keep the furniture one uh, model number here. And uh, if people are consumed that furniture, then they will replenish one more uh, carton, sorry, one more pallet. Any questions on this uh, storage type? So there are different types of storage, you know, you can go on and on, you can Google them bulk storage, uh, ASRS storage, high rack storage, or shelf storage, uh, yard storage or open general storage, cold storage, SRS storage, forward picking areas, yard storage. Okay, no questions um, on this. Um. So the most important thing is the HU control is at the storage level, you know, so type level. I told you, unlike the ECC uh, thing, wherein the HU activation is at the storage location level, you need a partner location. Here it's very uh, easy, more flexible. And in a given bin, you know, the ultimate uh, experience is in a given bin, we can have both HU and non-HU stocks coexisting in a bin. That is a beauty or ultimate flexibility in EWM. Am I audible? All good? Let's hear from you guys while I, you know, go to the surface and take some uh, air. Any, anything different for the cold storage or hazardous material storage? Uh, that's one of the just the locations. Yeah, cold storage, there are some product master indicator, you know, the temperature. Uh, Things we have to bind it on the PASI, the put away control indicator. Hazardous, there is a hazardous master, and then there are, you know, the uh, regulatory things are there, the water pollution class and everything. Basically, just keep in mind hazardous and um, DG, there are separate masters, you know, and you need to know some additional uh, you know, features and functions uh, if you're working in a chemical or explosive uh, industries. You know. Basically, there are two more masters, you know, uh, hazardous master and DG master. Uh, over and above the product master. So the attributes will be flowing from the hazardous master uh, as well, you know, in determining the bin. Like the water pollution class, they have WPC1, WPC2, and blah, 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 all that. Yeah. Temperature control is not a big thing. I mean, any industry, you have to, you know, classify them ambient or, you know, the normal temperature and then the cool room temperature or whatever. Right? So temperature control is quite common. And it all translates into PASI only because the put-away control indicator will tell you where you need to store, which storage type you have to store the goods. So, so as I said, they go for as many storage types uh, so that the additional controls we have, section and bin type can be used effectively. You know, we will have more ammunition uh, and keep fighting. That's additional controls we will have. So based on the activity performed, the work centers are classified like VAS or quality inspection. These are all storage types only, you know. VAS storage type, uh, VAS work center, quality inspection work center. Uh, so broadly speaking, a five, uh, there could be more also. That will decide uh, uh, the storage. Type. But at the end of the day, storage type is nothing but a group of bins. Uh, so logical subdivision and group of bins. So each storage type has a role to play. I told you, uh, standard storage type, ID point, pick point. Um, a combination, if you are very tentative, we don't know the direction, uh, we can play safely by having a combined role, combination role, ID and pick point. Similarly, staging area, we do only uh, verification and you know sorting and labeling activities. We don't want to create any bottleneck there. Normally, we do the uh, regular processes at the work center. But if it's a very space constrained, you don't have uh, 
at complicated activities in the work center, then you can take a combined role. You know, the work center can be in the staging area itself, then the door and yard. Then the, for ASRS, we have two different uh, role and production supply. Nothing great, you know, three, five, 10 only or, or 11, more than 12, sorry. Any questions guys on this role? ID point and pick point, we talked about it. Door, we know, right? Door, everyone knows. The door at the home, same thing, right? Door. Staging area is the area immediately, you know, if you get anything from Flipkart or Amazon, you receive them and you check them. That is the staging area. And ID point and pick point, this is the ID point. For inbound, you check the, the dimensions, the weight, the volume, whatever. That's ID point. Pick point. Uh, what is pick point? Somebody talked on the other day. No, already we know the pick point. Anyone else want to talk other than Charu? Huh? Because uh, Chaitanya, Sandeep, Rashi, Mayur. What is big point? Am I audible? All good? Line not, not disconnected, right? I got a new Airtel connection mm -hmm. now. No idea? It's a staging, a staging kind of thing for the picking. Uh, for the picking. Hmm. Uh, where you can combine, yeah. ID point is more put away and the pick, pick point is for the picking staging. Yeah. Pick point mm -hmm. is more for outbound. You're right. Uh, yeah, let's show you a video, you know, YouTube video. It's a pick point. You will not never forget in your life then. Entire screen with the audio maybe. Share. So this is a big point, you know, there could be a number of scenarios, but the gray orange. You know? Face, chest, armpit, neck, leg. Well, hello, and thank you for your interest in gray orange. I want to spend a few minutes. So this is a big point, you know, the guy is behind uh, the entire uh, mobile unit. What is called, this is called, um, um, what is, there's a nice term for it actually, shelf unit, but it's called, um, uh, yeah, you will explain anyway. So it's a complete uh, unit. Uh, the slotting will run and it will suggest based on the, you know, ordering pattern and the historical data, it will say which products can be kept together so that, you know, multiple orders uh, when they're coming. Uh, if you get the complete shelf by the gray orange robot, you know, the robot will come and fetch the, this mobile unit, uh, shelf unit, and then brings it to the pick point. This is the pick point, you know, the desktop. And the guy will be uh, guided to pick the product and how much product also, the light might glow. Uh, which is called pick to light and then it will say how much he has to drop in different uh, totes meant for different customers here you know he's having a shelf, <laughs> shelf here and then that's where uh, he can do the put to light so it's a combination of pick to light and put to light uh, and the entire mobile unit will come to this pick point and then he take what he wants for different orders basically he maximizes the you know allocation and then he returns back the pallet you know sorry returns back the mobile unit that's a big point. Two minutes today talking to you about our goods to person picking process. I'd like to start the introduction by talking about what you can't see in the video. Our solutions are run by our software, Gray Matter, which is a warehouse foundational system that drives automation. It resides between your WMS and our automation, optimizing the outbound picking process or other functions that you're solving either with gray orange automation or other automation product and let's or whatever going. the next step is in yeah. your outbound process even quality control or any other aspect of the outbound. let's watch a video later you know you understood the concept right this is the one you know the complete mobile uh, shelf unit is coming to the pick point work center and it's saying how much he has to pick and how much he has to drop in different uh, totes or you know different uh, cartons uh, meant for uh, you know different customers so the moment you get this one uh, you are maximizing the allocation and for keeping the items together, that's a challenge. You know, you are running the slotting algorithms to know which ones are uh, ideally, you know, to be stored together. 
and this I am not sure, you know, how you will map it. Only Charu knows whether I slotted at you or because this is mobile, you know, you're getting this complete unit mode by this robot, you know, underneath uh, the robot is going and fetching Creation. the mobile. Yeah, you see. I want to spend just a few minutes talking to you about goods to person as a concept. This is a solution strategy that's been around for a long time, uh, made famous, of course, by our friends at Amazon Robotics. Here at Gray Orange, we've further refined and developed the technology to really optimize the outbound picking solution uh, as it relates to goods to person. Conceptually, what's going on here is our picker is standing stationary in his station. The robots are presenting product to him where he's being directed what items to pick and place for each order that is being filled through this station. So you can see the efficiencies and economics of this strategy in that all of the time currently spent walking in a more manual environment or RF-based picking environment, even batch picking or discrete order picking, all of that walking is eliminated with a goods to person concept. We work hard with our clients to make sure that you think through how the inventory should be stored and maintained inside our system in order to optimize the outbound fulfillment. Just like in a traditional manual environment, the slotting strategy or how you store product in your pick faces really drives the efficiency of the picking process itself. Our software... Understood uh, the pick point. Um... Any questions on the pick point? Um, huh, this. Bipin? No, we are good. Good, right? Yeah. Okay, so now let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. So that's a ID point and pick point. Let's just quickly see. This is a mezzanine, just some concepts. So there, there's no scope for you, know, you to. Uh, carry the equipment, the forklift or the hand pallet jack or whatever. So maybe the hand pallet jack is okay. So you just climb up and then, you know, store the goods. As I said, uh, mostly the totes uh, or the cartons, you store them, you don't distribute them. And less than pallet load is taken from here. Whereas the pallet load is taken from the pallet storage, you know, or the rack storage. Um, that is mezzanine for you. And then um, this is the ID point. Okay. Uh, I shouldn't say HOP, you know, HOP is different. Huh? ID point is different. Okay. So ID point is this one. Uh, it's not a great slide, but this is a good one. You know, ID point is you can imagine the sensor is detecting the all the things, you know, the contour, the shape, the label, and any other defect before giving it to the crane and causing an accident. So it's a responsibility of the, you know, the, the, the sensor uh, detecting and giving the green signal to the crane. You know, the crane is doing the put away. If any problem is detected, it is written back to production. So this is the handshake area between the manufacturing and the warehouse. That is the ID point for you. Then the pick point, we just now saw the same picture I have taken, the pick point. And uh, the aisle is dark and narrow, you know. Normally you can't do the partialing. You don't want to trouble the picking operator, you know, he's uh, less uh, experienced. And this guy is a very experienced guy. So he can do the allocation uh, real fast and he's smart in doing the allocation. It makes sense to bring the goods to the person rather than person, you know, going and figuring out in the dark, dark and narrow aisle, you know, what needs to be picked and how it needs to be allocated. Even though you do batch picking, it is uh, not really efficient. Uh, okay, now it's coming to the uh, pick point, the product flow. If a customer asks for a full pallet, it would be directly moved to the staging area. There are two customers, C2 and C3. Uh, he's asking for a full pallet, it's directly going. And uh, another uh, product uh, needed for both the customers, C1 and C2. Where is C1 here? Okay, C1 is missing anyways. So C1, C2 need some partial quantities. For example, a pallet is brought, added quantity. 60 allocated to C1 or 40 to C2. Likewise, you can imagine, right? There could be multiple uh, customers, more customers. Um, the, the classical example I told you, like the Walmart, uh, you bring the you know, the parachute, the Britannia biscuits or any other FMCG product and then do the allocation to different stores and then you're done. This is a big point for you. And you return the pallet back to the storage, you know, at the end of the shift or whatever, you know, the next day also. Big point will only bring by combining the requirements that it knows. Uh, if it's a full requirement, it will skip the pick point. Uh, there's no need to, you know, route it via pick point. Uh, understood the pick point uh, product flow? Any questions on? Hmm? 
no es no that's okay. all good easy right A straightforward one okay now let's keep going okay i'll do this thing later okay the door and staging areas so door you know door is the uh, physical location where tus will be docked to facilitate loading or unloading door acts as a bridge you know bridge entity uh, what is bridge so this is the i section you know like the um, you know the rail tracks the i section uh, it's a common section and we have doors on both sides you know one on the warehouse side and the other one on the yard side actually so we have bins duplicated here for the yard storage type and also for the warehouse uh, door storage type 9030 uh, so the door is the common entity uh, which is uh, marrying the two bins uh, on either side and the door to staging area could be one to many or many to one relationship and we can dedicate a door for inbound or outbound or we can say uh, it can be done both you know unloading and loading can happen both uh, yeah assignment of su is optional unlike the warehouse number where it is mandatory here it is optional you know uh, if for example you have a rail side uh, on the northwest you have the rail side door maybe you want to highlight to your stakeholders that you know the expected uh, uh, you know unloading locations are, are expected there you know you can show it in the graph uh, if it's one kilometer or you know quite a distance then you can marry to a supply chain unit also and show it in the uh, network staging area staging area we talked about it's an area to organize the flow of goods and uh, goods are staged immediately after unloading or just before loading used for verification inspection labeling blah 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 all that usage and um, the door to staging area could be again you know one door uh, can point to multiple staging areas or other way around one staging area can have multiple doors as well so normally we talk about staging area but actually speaking this is a section and uh, staging area group is the storage type and bay is the bin you know so why do we no need to go at this level mapping you know uh, very very granular mapping is required you know so for loading sequence you know you want to bring pallet number 1 to 10 to bay number 3 or 31 bay is a bin staging area is a section and staging area group is the storage type so at the end of the day we have only three things in our uh, kitty right storage type section and bin all that we have is storage type section and bin okay so this is required one for uh, loading sequence or stop sequence uh, maybe stop sequence and then uh, maybe for the uh, customer specific consolidation for example if there are multiple pickers all can you know converge at this bay you know for a customer so all the items required for a customer are consolidated at this bay 3.31 oh, understood yeah any questions on the door and staging area role Pick point ID point rule. Okay, stop me if you're not following. These are critical, you know, the storage type, understanding the, I'm just providing the building blocks to you guys and uh, ID point, pick point, uh, you know, the door and staging area, clear? No questions at all? Okay. Now, section. All right, section. Section is again a logical subdivision of the storage type, uh, grouping of bins only, but in this time it's uh, uh, like fast moving, slow moving, which are dynamic in nature. Like you can store the heavy items on the lower most rack uh, and then the light items on the top most rack. Maybe it is having more headroom, space is uh, freely utilized. At the same time, light items are kept so that it, it doesn't crumble. And you know the heavy items are kept at the lower runs. So normally we do the section mapping for fast, medium, slow, or heavy bulk or light. And also as others a cold room, a corrosive ones, you know, corrosive ones, you don't want to, you know, something leaking on the top and then, you know, spoiling the ones at the bottom. Um, so section is a plug and play. What I meant by plug and play is uh, dynamic. Uh, storage type means once decided, uh, you have to do the configuration change only. But section is plug and play, meaning uh, uh, tomorrow, today you have only 50 bins for a fast mover and you need some more bins, uh, you can grab it from the slow move. You can take it on a loan basis from slow moving. So slow moving, you can take some 
uh, 20, 20 bins from slow moving and convert them to fast moving uh, in this transaction LS11. You know, that's what I say plug and play. Uh, you know, dynamically you can assign and unassign. Uh, you can uh, sort of encroach and you know give it on loan basis. Uh, any questions on the section? Um, so the one close to the wall, right? Assuming this is a forward a front area, the area to the front, and then that's a rear area close to the wall. The stack number one to 20 are all uh, fast moving section. Stack number 21 all the way to 30 are slow movers, you know, because this is at the rear end of the barrels. Um, and so section search could be product driven or product neutral section is only for we used to put the section indicator in the material uh, here also since it is product driven so we also get yeah put any product indicator. neutral also you know initially yeah. a new product comes we don't know the history historical data so it's called mm -hmm. product neutral you know the new product will go to a earmarked uh, section and from there after once we have the uh, you know or you can do a bin to bin also you know if you decide uh, and you know Product neutral means uh, uh, the, there's no indicator in the product master. Mm -hmm. uh, you can define a sequence for that. Uh, product driven means it's a fast mover. It will go to fast. If not, then only it will go to slow. A slow mover will go to slow. If there is no bins, then only it will come to maybe medium mover. You know, Product neutral means uh, you'll have one more sequence mm -hmm. for that. And accordingly, it will go. Meaning there is no indicator in the product master. Uh, Okay, let's just throw some uh, uh, yarn on the bin. So the bin is the smallest spatial unit. And, um, you know, normally it's identified by the three dimension coordinate, aisle, stack, and level. So everyone knows aisle, stack, level, I assume, right? I'm just explain a bit. Aisle means that's the place, you know, where the, the TTR or the air hostess will be traveling, you know, that's the aisle. And then the stack is, uh, these are the perpendicular to the aisle or the stack, 1, 11, 21, or the stack. Uh, these are the stacks. Normally, we have the even number on the right hand side and the odd number on the left hand side, like a postman or the courier guy delivering the, you know, the parcels. Okay, so these are the stacks, and levels are simple, right? A three tier or two tier coach. Yeah. So levels, level is straight towards the god. <laughs> we don't know god is in which direction. Stack is perpendicular to the aisle. Yeah, aisle stack and level. Following ASL. In EWM, we can have additional two more digits, you know, B and D also, bin subdivision and bin depth. You can uh, remember like, you know, ASL, BD, where is it? Uh, okay, I don't have it. Or yeah, I don't have it. ASL, BD, you know, aisle stack level, uh, bin subdivision and bin depth. ASL, BD, easy to remember. Now, you can say this is a inbound aisle, meaning you don't expect anyone coming on the other, aid, other way, you know, there could be potential accident. Um, so this is the inward aisle and this is the outward aisle. You know, you can't people go inside from here to uh, like some warehouses, they have some safety considerations and you know, they have a pattern. This is called a U pattern. Similarly, we can imagine a W pattern or a S pattern or whatever, you know, like a snake. Uh, yeah. Wriggling through it. So now same like your courier man, you can imagine, right? He enters the road and there is just distributing the courier on the left hand side, we have the odd number, right hand side, we have the even number. And at the end of the road, you can have a fag and coffee and enjoy, you know, job done, you can relax. So that's a put away or picking, you know, if you are going with a trolley or a cart. So at the bin master level, uh, we have a lot of attributes, you know. Uh, the bin has to belong to a storage type, of course. And section, I told you, plug and play. Bin access type and bin type. Bin type is the one which brings in the qualification to the bin, meaning the dimension or the weight volume. Bin access type means uh, the qualification for the resource, whether a particular resource can you know, access this level or not. For example, a reach truck is required to reach level five, you know, whereas a forklift can go up to level three. That is controlled by the bin access type. Uh, okay, and you can stop at uh, phase one without mapping the geo coordinates. But if you want the geo coordinates to be mapped XYZ, you can uh, plot your warehouse in a reduced scale. Uh, you know, at the bottom left, we have the absolute uh, XYZ axis. And from there, you can plot the warehouse. And then it will be displayed nicely in the GWL. This is called graphical warehouse layout. You know, so you plot your entire warehouse in a reduced scale. 
and this is your GR area and this is a rack storage and uh, you know these are the node where people will travel. Each node, sorry, each uh, uh, what is it? Edge. Uh, edge is the one where people will travel, and each edge will be connected by two node, same like your human, you know, nerve centers or chakras. Uh, any questions on the graphical? This is a you know optional activity. Uh, if you want to uh, you know calculate the accurate travel distance and you know if you want to leverage on the Vero's insights, then you go for plotting the Vero's in a reduced scale, uh, a detailed labor management, the diamond distance calculation, and uh, you know uh, the uh, resource uh, reporting. Then you go for uh, the plotting the Vero's in the X Y Z scale. Otherwise, this is optional. Uh, any questions, guys, uh, on the bin? So now let's look at the config. Um, no questions. All good. A storage type. Yeah. Uh, where is number section? Stop me if you are feeling that you know too much, then we can spend some time on the config also. Uh, 11.53, so it's time to spend some time in the system. Uh, it will throw you out, you know, for even for three, four minutes of inactive, I think it will throw you out. Uh, it's just a blessing in disguise, otherwise people will lock. Even if someone locks it, you know, right? You go to SMTL and you know, throw them out. Uh, So I go to storage type, uh, SPRO, EWM, master data, storage type. Don't ask me why it is under master data. It's org element only, but SAP is keeping them in the master data. Anyone has any idea why it is under master data? We don't know. So type, it's okay. Now you see, these are the important thing. For example, I don't have the triple zero one. I have only the, uh, the US 1710 model bearers. So let's take anything, doesn't matter. Each storage type has a role to play. We talked about the role, ID point, pick point, combination, staging area, work center, combination, and then two for ASRS and one for production supply area, door and yard, door and yard, staging area group, uh, yeah, that's it. And then the HU control is here, you know, uh, whether HU is mandatory or not allowed or you know, optional. If you say optional, that means uh, both the things can be there. HU and non-HU can coexist in a bin. Okay, so these are the important controls at the storage type level. And um, the hazardous uh, substance management. Um, after uh, maybe, you know, the wetness day next week, uh, you should be knowing at least some 50% of the fields, you know, here. Yeah. When I know some 90% only. Some of the fields I'm not 100% sure. Okay, storage type, anything, any, you want any clarification? At this point in time, if you know storage type role and then the HU requirement is good enough actually. And then the put away rules are here. Addition to stock, uh, next empty bin, general storage, a transit warehouse, a consolidation group. And these are the other uh, rules, you know, kept separately. The bulk storage, the pallet storage, the flexible storage. Okay, we're going to discuss everything later. But now, as of now, the storage type uh, is the one uh, where a lot of controls are there. If you know the storage type configuration uh, in tandem with the WPT configuration, I think you know 15 to 20% of EWM. 20%? Why 15? It's a section. So this is a section you create, a total section, fast moving, slow moving, you know, uh, AV section, light section, whatever sections you create. And um, and then you go to the bin master. So LS11, LS11. So let's take my warehouse, EW07, TRKG rack storage. And uh, so these are the bins, right? Uh, today, fast mover, tomorrow, if these bins are slow mover, I can change them, you know, I can change them. Not a problem, I can just put slow mover. This is what I say, plug and play. 
but you can't change the storage type you know you have to delete and recreate them um, so we talked about remember when we compared the wm vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ewm uh, the wm section is mandatory your section is not mandatory and bin is unique at the warehouse number level you know in ewm whereas bin is unique at the storage type level over there that's why we have a huge field here you know 18 digits or so so if you don't if for example 0101a i am using it for rack storage and 0101a i want to use it for shelf storage also in that case i can um, in that case i can prefix with the storage type you know i can have the storage type as the prefix and you know labeling it's up to you how you want to print the label but the barcode can be still 0101a you know the barcode if you are, want to use the old barcode you can still use 0101a meaning the barcode is captured here the verification field it can still have 0101a it need not have the full uh, all the characters you know are you guys following how does it then differentiate because that 0101a will be also be available for the other storage type then yeah if you are not trusting the person you know you better put a prefix also and ensure that the barcode is there in the label you can have some check digit and other things you know i'm not that uh, yeah now remembering the check digit concept so you can implement a check digit you know for example uh, uh, in the rack storage the check digit could be different you know compared to the shelf storage check mm -hmm. check digit <laughs> It's a good point you raised. You might go to shelf storage and you will confirm 0101A, right? You're saying. Bipin? Yeah, yeah. Is it Bipin or Charu? Yeah. All right. Bipin. So it's a good point. So you got the understanding, right? Here, the bin yeah. is unique at the warehouse number level. That's why to make it unique, you prefix it with the, 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 the storage type, just in case, you know, if you're repeating the same nomenclature. And um, yeah, in that case, the verification field will be different from the actual bin. And up to you, you know, what you want to show in the label and the barcode, it's up to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is for uh, pick by voice. So, so this uh, storage bin is a huge one. Uh, if you see the WM bin, it's very simple bin. You know, here it's a lot of attributes are there. Section, I told you. Then bin access type we talked about. And bin type is the one which brings in the weight volume. Either you can... Uh, uh, get the data populated via the bin type, meaning from the configuration, or directly we can maintain the weight volume. You know, uh, weight volume directly maintenance means uh, any Tom, Dick, and Harry can go and maintain. It's not a disciplined one. But if you want a controlled and disciplined one, you don't foresee any uh, change, frequent change to the bin, then uh, pass it via the bin type. Uh, then nobody can change it. You know, even still people can maintain, but they can maintain a lower value. For example, the bin type says 100 kilogram. Uh, you can make it 80, you know, because temporarily the bin structure is not that good. You can't say 120, you know, meaning more than the configuration you can't say. And uh, yeah, that's the important thing. And we talked about the XYZ mapping to display them in the GWL and also to seamlessly, you know, connect with our uh, Varo's insights, the BTP stuff. And um, I told you additional things are there like the bin subdivision and bin depth also there, you know, you can go on and on, ASLBD. Okay, the next one says stock. Uh, if you're seeing two rows, that means two coins are there in the bin because two batches are there. If you see 10 rows, then 10, 10, 10 coins, simple. Any variation to the material or the batch or the disposal party, which is your PED or the owner or the stock type or special stock, GR date, you know, these are all, uh, the attributes which will uh, make it a unique quantum. Then there is a dedicated tab for bin sectioning. And also the bin can belong to multiple activity areas and which are the incoming tasks and which are the outgoing tasks, you know, so that we can cancel them or, or we can expedite them. So from the bin point of view, what are the inbound tasks and what are the outbound tasks? And also the bin marriage to the PSA, production supply area and physical inventory, you know, uh, any active document or uh, whether the bin is uh, active in the document or not. Stock tab. From here, you can drill down to the stock or the quant list. Uh, yeah, that's about the bin master. And uh, any questions on the bin master or the storage type? Huh? So with this transaction, LS11, <coughs> you can do all the changes, you know. See, you can do many things. You, know, you select a range of bins and then 
change the section, change the bin type, bin access type. Uh, you can reset back to the, you know, back to square one. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, you can do the blocking and unblocking in the monitor method. You know, you go to monitor. I don't know why they kept it there, uh, uh, not in this transaction, you know, storage bin. So I take the rack storage. D means storage type, you know, I'm just dedicating one character for uh, main storage D and all my uh, uh, work centers will have, you know, all the interim areas will have Y. Eight for uh, work centers and nine for staging areas. And uh, yeah, T for the main storage. Um, done. So here we can block the bin or for put away or for removal, or you can do a total block for both put away and removal and internal move also. And you can see the change log, you know, who has done the change and what else. And from here, you can print the bins also. And um, bin creation quickly, you know, you can either create individual bins in LS01. You can go to LS01 and create individual bins, LS01, and create a test bin one by one, you know, by giving the rack storage, DRKG. This is the individual bin creation or you normally create from a structure, you know, so you go to SPRO and here we define the structure, same like WM, you know, if you know WM, these are the advantage. So you go to the master data bin. So this is what I talked about, the identifier, uh, the Isla bath, like a Faisla bath, easy to remember, ASLBD, uh, A for aisle, S for stack, L for level, B for bin subdivision and D for depth. Uh, if you are crazy, you can just create something else. Also, X, Y, Z also we can do. Okay, then now uh, bin structure is here. So I'll take the complex one. Now all are level only. Nothing for subdivision and depth anyway. So so you can imagine, you know. So this is A is a uh, aisle, S is stack, and L is level. Uh, you can go, uh, the next digits you can use for B means bin subdivision and D is bin depth. Uh, character for the values which are not changing and numeric for the increment. So we can give a start value and we can give an end value and we can give an increment, you know? meaning I have five times six, 30, 30 times A, B, C, D, E, five. 150 bins will be created in one shot. Five times six, 30, 30 times five is 150 because the increment is one, one, one. So if you say increment one, two means the stacks on the uh, even stacks on the left hand side and the odd stacks on the other way around. Yeah. So you can go with the maybe you'll start with two, you know, doesn't make sense. So two to six. Yeah. Likewise, you know, you can decide. Uh, and XYZ, you can give it here. Uh, X uh, increment is here. Uh, increment is here. And start values are here. Okay. So that's about the bin master. And I told you how to do the mass change to the bin and also how to block and unblock the bin using the monitor method. So with that, we will end that today's session. Um, thank you guys. Uh, talk to you on Monday morning, Monday, nine o'clock. Bye-bye. Thank you for attending the session. I hope you all enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel also feel free to ask your questions in the comment section below, and we will reply to them at the earliest.